Ladies and gentlemen, I think we are live. Woo. I timed it. Yes. <laughs> and we are live. This is the weekly podcast that covers music production news and events, including what's going on in the rock and guitar worlds, as well as some nerdy technical talk about computers and such that relate to what we do at our recording studio. That is Hop Pole Studios. Coming to you live from Manchester, England. I'm your host, Adam Steele, and joining me is Liam Wright. Hello. And this is the Hop Pole Position Podcast. Number 25! <laughs> I was going to put it on my iPad then realised. There we go! Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I've got my script on a tiny little screen. <laughs> I was going to have it on an iPad and then realised I've not brought it. He told me he's going to memorise it for next week, though. I'm trying my best. <laughs> How are you this week? Uh, good, yeah. Been in the studio today. It's yes. been fun. Both of us in the studio at the same time for a rare occurrence. Yeah, it's been really good. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, because we've got a whole what's new this week section. Okay, you asked me. Okay. Yeah, I was just asking how you... You're okay, I, I, you're I am good, well. end sentence. <laughs> I am full of a cold, but also good. Yeah, and no, I'll say that. Actually, I woke up this morning and I was ill. As, it's really weird. I've got a cold that comes and goes. So I was ill on Tuesday, fine on Wednesday. And then I was ill this morning. Now I'm fine. And I'm pretty sure it's coming back again. So I've it's got like a, that. a rainbow of different, like, I had a sore throat one day, really bad eyes the next day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm having a throat day today. Oh, dear. But that's fine. Cause British I'm, problems. Uh, yes. Um, I've managed to kind of get the film schedule in such a way that that I'm not talking on mm -hmm. camera today. So, um, let's do the uh, the next bit of the script, shall we? Uh, the podcast is live at 8pm UK time on YouTube, Facebook and Twitch. Which is now. And now. And also Mixer. Uh, now. Uh, and can be found afterwards as a podcast through iTunes, Spotify and our own website, hotpolestudio.co.uk. Links are all in the description uh, where you can see the latest videos from the YouTube channel and any social updates and such. Uh, coming up tonight, we'll be talking about the new uh, Waves version 11 and how that's stupid. <laughs> yep, uh, the tiniest little MIDI device I've ever seen. Uh, My Chemical Romance are back. Oh, they went away? For 12 years. For 12 years? 12 years, mate. Wow. Yeah, and I'm genuinely excited about that, so we'll talk yeah, about that okay, very soon. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Yep. Kerry King isn't playing BC Riches anymore. Uh, Dave Mustaine isn't playing any more anymore because he's selling it all. Uh, that Kurt Cobain guitar sold for a lot, and Gibson are losing more uh, in legal battles Ooh. every day. So that's going to be coming up this evening. Oh, and I've just got an email from Sound Toys. They are releasing their Sound Toys bundle for the, their final time in 32-bit. Ooh. Literally just came in just now, so this is breaking news. Breaking news! Breaking, 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 breaking. breaking, breaking. Um, so yeah, it, it seems that 32-bit plugins are finally on the way out. Well, were we talking about that before? We were indeed, and the proof is in the pudding. Um, mm, pudding. The, yeah, pudding. Uh, the the Slate uh, plugins haven't been 32-bit for a few months now at all. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't even make it, they don't compile mm -hmm. it, they don't test it. And it seems that Sound Toys, who are one of the other big boys, don't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, what's new with you this week? <laughs> Biscuits, right? Uh, this, a UK biscuit is an American cookie. A US biscuit is that? Is it a dumpling? I think it's kind of like a dumpling or a cracker or. Because you have it with gravy. But it's not the gravy we know. Oh, it's not the gravy we know. No, it's more like Swedish gravy. It's quite light. It's quite creamy. Ah. It's complete. So, so that my day today has been mostly trying to figure out what American biscuits are without just googling it. Um, <laughs> just imagining the possibilities. No, um, what's new with me? Um, other than what we spoke about before, um, not much. Just more same old, same old, really. Right. Like, nothing that super interesting, unfortunately. Oh, it's been all go for me this week. I mean, one thing is we we had a, a big sit down meeting earlier today to talk about our social stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, how had a potential gonna... uh, relaunch. Yeah. In the new year of the studio? Yeah, I don't want to go into too much detail because a lot of it's been what if mm -hmm. And, yeah, but... 
But I think given the meeting, so we're bringing someone else onto the team, uh, my wife. Um, and I feel that if we talk about a bit about it, it gives us the makes it reality as well. So yeah, like can't say too much because we're still in planning phase. But yeah, there's some really fun, exciting things happening probably in the new year. I'd say. Yeah, it, we're not selling out or anything. Just oh god, to, no, no, uh, it's just gonna. We be, just need more help. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> gonna be help. better in subtle ways. Mm-hmm. Subtle ways that that help us all. Yeah, so my wife has her own YouTube channel. It's a really small channel to do with um, planning and crafting. And she's got a lot of good skill sets. She does filming pretty much every day. Um, and we live above the studio. Um, so we're in a similar sort of location. So having Ash come and help out seems like a complete no-brainer, really. Because she's got a bit of a time available. So we need some help. We've got someone perfectly qualified. So, yeah, it's going to be pretty cool. Yeah. I'm pretty cool. And yeah, it's been a mad week for me. It was my other half's birthday yesterday, so we went to tropical birdland. Yeah, I was jealous about that. That sounded awesome. Yeah, get to have parrots sit on you and eat peanuts from your hands and stuff, mm. which sounds really cute, but parrots can take your finger off in a single bite if they mm. feel like it. Oh, dear. But they gem- these ones don't, because okay. they're kind of bred not to mm-hmm. and trained not to, but you just don't poke it in the eye, you know? <laughs> yeah. You look after yeah, them, yeah. they look after you. Yeah, it's all sense. cute. When you've got a one-year-old child that is just curious and wants to put fingers in things, you've got to be very careful with the mm-hmm. no, don't do that. <laughs> but I've got a very cute video of a a, a budgie landing on Ivy's head. <laughs> yeah, so that was cool. We should have dressed up for Halloween. Oh, I'll, I'll be dressing up tomorrow. Tomorrow. And Saturday, because as viewers know, I am a multi... Man, I do many things. Multi man. I am <laughs> the multi man. <multi-man. laughs> and tomorrow I'll be. The shit is superpower of working several different types of jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Watch me as I also become a live sound engineer. <laughs> so, over the next couple of days, I'm going to be doing live sound at the venue where I do that. And it's the Day of the Dead theme this year. Okay. So, for both days, I've got a full makeup kit, loads of black and white. Uh, I've got a proper, like, not a bowler hat, a proper top hat, mm-hmm. like Day of the Dead style. Gonna be wearing this jacket with a rose in it, mm-hmm. full uh, skeleton makeup, and skeleton makeup all the way down into the shirt, hopefully. And I've got color contacts. One night I'm gonna go with white people, white irises. One night I'm gonna go all black. Cool. Yeah. So I'm, it's the first year I've really gone for it. Creepy, creepy sound engineer. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Can you turn up the snare? No. <laughs> <laughs> There is enough snare in the ether. <laughs> I like so, it. So yeah, I, I, like I even it. got a uh, black hair spray so I can go full like mm-hmm. fully creepy. Nice. So that's going to be awesome. And yes, so uh, the other things that have happened this week, um, I got an email yesterday from the guys at the Reaper blog, which if anyone knows the channel, you'll know that we work with Reaper a lot. Mm-hmm. And they've got an app which has been out for a while. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't aware of it. And it's to do with making custom versions of the remote control for Reaper, which is all in built into Reaper, so you mm-hmm. can do custom stuff. So they've asked me to make a video about that, which is cool. Cool. But it's we'll really nice. It it's really nice to know that people in the field of Reaper are going Reaper World. Reaper World, yeah. Hey, that's not a YouTube channel yet. What Reaper World? Yeah. No. <laughs> in January, we will return as Reaper World. No. <laughs> yes, and I've I've got a, a Skype call coming up with a very well known producer, uh, which I'm not going to give any details of just yet, just in case, mm-hmm. in case nothing comes of it. Mm-hmm. But I've got a very exciting potential thing coming up. Yeah, that'd so be yeah, good. Talk more about that probably next week. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, before we talk about uh, this week's news, I'm reading off the script again. Apologies in advance. I was to briefly mention that this podcast is brought to you by you through Patreon. Yes, you. And you. And you. And you. Especially you on the end of the... <laughs> Not <day>. you. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> Not you, his wife. <laughs> no, everybody else. <laughs> uh, to, uh, a huge thanks to our supporters so far. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're trying to grow the podcast and the YouTube channel to be the full-time thing that we do. Mm-hmm. And you guys really help us to do that. Uh, we have a Discord server where all of our viewers can interact, ask questions, get support with their music production questions, and learn from each other. So if you join us on Patreon, you get a special status on the Discord server and access to patron-only channels, such as Ask Adam, where I take time out of whatever I'm doing to answer technical questions, and Rate My Mix for the super patrons who 
uh, literally send us their mix to listen, sit down and give feedback on that to see what can be improved and how and why, which a lot of producers, I think, don't talk about the why enough, why you should do Mm -hmm. more of this compression, this EQ, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because understanding to me is far more important than just turn this knob a little. Uh, We also try and release every video we can early exclusively to patrons and your feedback helps us be a better channel and helps us to make more and better content. So thank you everybody who supports us on Patreon. And if you don't, it's really appreciated if you check it out. And if you call Dave, you also or David, you also get a special uh, status as well because everyone is called David that watches this channel. Yes, indeed. I'm just grabbing the link. That's what I'm doing, so I can post it in the chat. Ah, uh, to the Discord. Mm-hmm. Yes. Ah, that went through to me. Yeah, it was the easiest way to get it onto my iPad from my phone. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> Uh, so, um, I'll move on to talking about the first piece of news this week while well, Liam does that because this is quite nerdy and is very much in my wheelhouse. So, uh, news article number one, let's see, make sure you can see the headline. Uh, Waves, one of the big boys in plugins, have just released their version 11 of their plugins, uh, updated the Renaissance line. It looks like they've got new skins, but apparently mm-hmm. they don't do anything new. Okay. Uh, they've got 1,400 new artist presets. Okay. And they've increased compatibility. Uh, so they've got the new... Um, the way that Waves plugins have worked for a long time mm-hmm. is they bring out a new version of what you call the Waves shell, which is kind of the thing, the plugin, not for whatever system you've got that has all their plugins in it. Mm-hmm. And that means it's then compatible with whatever. Apparently... Uh, uh, Apple's OS Catalina 10.15 has been a real issue for mm-hmm. a lot of producers. Mm-hmm. And so now they've announced that they've got this new version out which is compatible with that. Mm-hmm. Oper- new operating systems always lead to issues with stuff like this, don't they, quite uh, often? Doubly, triply so with Apple stuff recently. Mm-hmm. There's There's been a whole thing with it recently mm-hmm. where it's not exactly been ideal, to say the least. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, every time Apple have a new operating system, they've really... Uh, been oh apparently Patrick DeMonte just Patrick DeMonte oh subscribed <laughs> I need to change the uh, the setup it's that's the old Streamlabs overlay that's still on on that computer but the uh, the, the font size just said Patrick what, just, oh right yeah <laughs> it just said Patrick DeMonte just <laughs> just you know he just he just 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 cool <laughs> well thank you Patrick yeah thank you for just for just <laughs> <laughs> and so thing is this is where i'm gonna be a, a moaning git for a change for a change mm-hmm. uh the issue with waves updates compared to any other company's updates is that when any other company releases like a new version of a plugin or whatever either it's an entirely new thing in which case of course you're gonna pay mm-hmm. again. again yeah because like ozone new version of ozone you pay for it yeah new features new mm-hmm. stuff or if it's an incremental update that improves compatibility and squashes bugs, generally you don't pay for it mm-hmm. because it's uh, that's ongoing customer support. Yeah, security fixes and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, and the, the, the way that gets paid for is that there's another small amount of customers that can now use it because there's no mm-hmm. bugs and then they go on to buy it. and. Mm-hmm. A lot of it, I think you're trading on uh, you know, improving your good name. The cost for that is basically in the price of the product to begin with. That's the way. A good, if, if you're doing it right, like you're factoring in, it will be this per month and we will need to do this amount of bug fixing. Yeah. yeah. The issue with, for me with Waves plugins is that when you buy them, they give you a set amount of time that they will give you support for. And mm-hmm. outside of that time, I think it's a year, you pay again for their support plan. Mm-hmm. So, like, I can't use version 11 on a lot of the plugins that I bought, despite the fact that the sound from the plugin is identical and the feature set is identical. Right. If the, if Because a lot of them I've got either version 9 or version 10, and if I've bought them within the last year, I can just go ahead and update to version 11. So when you say support, it's not just support, you mean actual updates? Yeah. Yeah. Because there's a difference between getting just product support and having the the actual updates for anything yeah so this is yeah full full multi yeah, so multi essentially support. you're buying a license for the year is it year did you say yeah but it's not as much of a cost sometimes as the entire plugin but it's still 
a cost. Well, I mean, actually, think about it this way. So is it, it, it sounds more like, so, I mean, I don't really know what you spend on the waste plugins and stuff. I know you have them, but so you're paying for it for a year. And if you stop paying, you can still use it. Yes. But you can't update it to the new versions. Yeah. But when I say new versions, you don't get any no, new no, features no. or anything. Yeah. yeah. It literally just is frozen in time then, and if it stops working, you have to pay them. Mm. Which I mean, so the the up the other option is you just have a subscription model where you pay either monthly or yearly for it, mm. and then you lose access to it after a year. Which I would rather do. Okay. Because Preference, but yeah, because because at that point there's not been the huge initial outlay. That like some of these plugins are two or three hundred. Ah right, okay. Each. Right, okay. Right, then now paying, I'm tracking. Yeah, yeah it's the, so some that's of these bullshit. Are, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, if, if I'm with you. Some no. of the, yeah, some of these like are two or three hundred dollars each. Although there's because of the whole slate subscription thing being a competition, they're all perpetually on sale these days, which tells its own story. Yeah, so it just sounds like they're just behind the times. They need to that screen mental cough. Uh, probably. Um, yeah, they just need to get with the times and go with subscription services. Like the yeah. world is now subscription service. Yeah. Like because it just makes sense. Well. The world is either subscription service or in the plugin world, like you said originally, once you've bought expensive plugin, the support then is extended until that Yeah, but I, no I, I still don't even think that model works. I think just I, everything should be subscription because it's fucking awesome. Like the amount of stuff now, because it, it seems to work for the companies and it really works for the consumer. Mm. Like in gaming, I got the new um, Uplay Plus plugin and played a £40 game for a month for 12 quid and then pause my subscription because I don't want to play it anymore. Yeah. I've not had to pay for the game. But like I can start it up again at any point. Like Having subscription models where you can pause and start them again and get the value out of it works for both parties. And I think if they did something like that where you just pay monthly for it, it would work out way better. Because if some of these plugins are expensive, it, it, it would be quite an expensive thing per month. Like It would, wouldn't be a mass, like. But I bet it would still end up being a lot more affordable. Because if they got people on, like, would think like we go back to the original Adobe thing, because it's similar to that in this game, where you go to Creative Cloud, like that changed their whole model. Yeah. Because they were the same. Like you wouldn't get support for Premiere CS5 when CS6 came out. No, but any well, yeah, okay, it's a new version, but sometimes it was almost the same. Like CS4, CS5, not much was changed, and actually in the updates that you get from four to five, there's probably more changed. Then changed from like 4.8 or whatever it was on to 5. So, whereas you go into a subscription model with a, a Creative Cloud and everyone in the sun's got it because it's mm. just really affordable. Something that was seven grand can now be 50 pounds a month. So, what I mean, what's the cost of all the waves? Would you say ballpark? Well, they have a thing called the Mercury Bundle, which is the everything, um, and that's about six thousand dollars. Okay, it's premium tier stuff, yeah, but that per month. Is quite cheap, and if it go, if they could follow, oh, it's not as big they, a market as say Adobe. They but. do have subscription models that they do, which they've uh, waves subs. Need to into that more then. Anyway, I, I'm sure we talked about it before when mm -hmm. it came out. Um, very early on. Um, yeah, there we go. So yeah, they do have. It's more of a rent to own system that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, their biggest. Package is one hundred and forty nine dollars a month. Yeah, okay, that, that sounds like what I'd imagine. Yeah, but their main com competition has a very similar package, maybe with only half as many plugins for fifteen dollars a month. So they're behind the times in that way in terms of the pricing. But if you do go for one of these, you get all the support in terms of the plugin updates. Of course, you do. That's so. You currently don't have that. You do have the Slate plugin. Would you recommend that to anyone? The Slate plugin? No, that, that one. No. Yeah. No, uh, the pricing to me is absolutely absurd. Um, because it's even though it's like six grand's worth of plugins. Well, you're contracted into twenty four monthly payments for a start. Right. So you are then paying but about cancel three. Cancel anytime. Oh, cancel anytime. Sure, but if you cancel anytime, you then don't own it. Right. So yeah, if if you pay them nearly three thousand dollars, you then own them. Mm. But then they'll be out of date within a year, and you'll be out of support. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's all a little bit, a bit dated. Trying to cling to the past, it's missing the mark quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. Now, if all the plugins came in the forty nine dollars a month, mm -hmm. 
I I just have it mm-hmm. because I use enough Waves plugins to justify forty nine dollars a month. Mm-hmm. I don't use enough to justify three times that. And that's someone who does this for a living professionally. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, it's not worth it because as Waves become more and more irrelevant as a company because other companies are coming in with much more affordable and go- as good, if not better sounding mm-hmm. plugins, I use less and less and less of the wave stuff, which means I can't justify spending that. Like if they'd come out with this first before any of the guys like Slate had the really good sounding plugins and they were still the number one and the big dogs and, mm-hmm. and there was no real competition. I'd probably have started paying that. Yeah. But there's others out there that are either better or as good and don't cost a fraction of that. Mm-hmm. So here's a the question then. Their big thing is that they have it's like over 160 plugins, so they're all Waves plugins. Yeah. What is the benefit, if any, to a mix for using old plugins from the same manufacturer? None. There never. That hasn't been for a long time. It, and and they, there's no way they can make it as such by having any sort of integration between them. And yeah, doesn't seem that way. Yeah. So. Yeah, that, like in a world where you can buy lots of other smaller subscription services or smaller value plugins and build a library similar, it seems like you just need to yeah get with the times. That's it. And like any like, Slate are a great example. If you really want to buy their plugins, just buy them outright. You can. They're about hundred and fifty dollars each, and uh, the any updates that come out are yours for life. Because you've invested in them, you've you've put the seed money in. You mm-hmm. know, if you've paid for one hundred and fifty dollars for a plugin, it's but I thought soft- you said that didn't happen because you've got version nine. No, for for slate, oh for slate, slate. Yeah. sorry sorry slate, so, slate, right? Yeah, so for the slate as an ex- as a great example, um, if I pay one hundred and fifty dollars, it's software. It's no, there's no outlay for them. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's because they've also got a better subscription model that, that is clearly the mainstay of their business. Therefore, they know they're going to be maintaining them anyway. Yeah. So allowing someone else the updates doesn't take your skin off their back. Say, okay, yeah. you've bought it out, right? You've given us capital up front. You can have updates for as long as we continue doing it because yeah. these guys are paying for us to do it each month. The presets, is that make it any better? Artist presets, being able to have someone's guitar sound, EQ? No. Big, no, presets... For me, are largely useless. Mm-hmm. There are a few plugins where they can come in handy, like really technical ones, like multi-band compressors. It can give you a nice jumping-off point. If you're trying to emulate a sound for some reason, like covers recordings or something, you would have to be given the exact original sound in mm. for it to do the right thing coming out. But that's what I'm thinking. So if you're like, okay, I want to be a covers band for, um, I don't know, someone would be relevant that would have one of the presets on here and you buy all the same gear that they use, so you've got the same signal chain, and now you've got the same plugins with the same presets. Yeah. In that small niche case, does maybe, it add value? Maybe in that very small <laughs> niche case, but, I mean, it's a reach. It's a real <laughs> reach. Because, I mean, there are some, like, there's some, that they, they do a synth plugin called mm-hmm. Element. Mm-hmm. I flick through presets on things like a synthesizer because I want to go, not that sound, not that sound, not that sound, that's mm-hmm. close then do a little tweaking and that can save me a lot of time but on something like an EQ it doesn't know if the thing I'm sending it has like too much bass or not enough treble or whatever to begin with what so the you? presets don't help what about you guys in in the comments in the chat um, do you ever use presets what do you find them useful for see whether you can uh, go against Adam's grain is there any other ideas that we've not thought of because yeah because well, it seems like that's almost their headline here it's yeah. like we have presets for like because They've, it's taken them some work to like even just admin wise to get all those presets together from people so they've invested something in doing that thinking that it's important to them yeah but that was the old thing it used to way back in even years ago when I first started using Waves plugins at university because they had Waves licenses on every computer they had a few well known producers presets and I tried them all and they were all terrible mm-hmm. not because the producers were terrible because it's not, not the same sound because I wasn't feeding it the same noise that they had. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the inbuilt kind of stock presets mm-hmm. could be relatively useful as a starting point. <laughs> as Sebastian Five in the chat has exactly said, and I didn't see that before I said it, honest. Um, but 
Uh, yeah, quite often you can go, especially with the stock presets, you can go... This one See, I'd get rough. that if you've got like vocal EQ sets and it's like male vocal, female vocal, rock vocal. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. But this isn't that. No. This is this is my sound for whatever song or mm. imagine or the EQ I like to use in general. Yeah. So this this is where things like like I say that there's there's some plugins that are not necessarily quite as run of the mill. Like there was one that was a multi band transient shape, which is all to do with attack on notes and that kind of stuff. And Jack Joseph Puig, who's a very well-known mixing engineer, had made a preset that was based on a guitar, an acoustic guitar part. There was a, f- a song by Fergie called "Girls Don't Cry," "Big Girls Don't Cry." No, um, yeah, something Someone like about that. crying. Yeah, yeah, no, that that was a song from the '60s, but "Girls Don't Cry," I think it was. And the acoustic guitar really had a proper jing 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 kind of thing that really stood out on the radio. Mm-hmm. And he put his preset in there. Which, when I slapped it on an acoustic guitar, I just went, oh, yeah, that's that's that sound. Mm-hmm. Never used it. But I was like, oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Made me think that, well, maybe there is a use for this plugin after all. Mm. Yeah, okay. Things like that. But if if that works for you, cool. But I can't see it being of majority benefit. Not the reason you're going to buy it. No. No, it's one of those things where I might poke around on a free afternoon and go, oh, that's cool. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. So, we're talking about this for a long time, but considering it's a one-page article, <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot to talk about with it, though. Uh, so, moving on. Uh, Old Blood Noise Endeavours, that is a very long company name, <laughs> uh, have a thing they've released called the Marr, or Microphone Audio Workstation. And this thing, it's a mic preamp, but it's also got octaves, delays, reverbs, all sorts of crazy stuff, and mm-hmm. actual effects loops. And it looks like something out of Rick and Morty from here. Yeah, it sounds like something out of Rick and Morty. Oh, really? It sounds a bit like that show me what you got kind of <laughs> thing. Um, it, but it's really cool. It's all in one pedal, and you can turn sections on and off with your feet. Mm-hmm. But it's all analog, as far as I know. Because a lot of the... Uh, it, a lot of these uh, vocal stomp pedals have been digital, uh, quite prime, you know, what's the word, basic, and never, to me, sounded very good. Mm-hmm. But this one could be quite interesting. There's some samples in this video. of it. He's, This this guy uh, is live demoing, so his friend in the background is actually singing with a jazz trio. Mm-hmm. And it's really quite saturated and distorted as it goes, but he's got this microphone that obviously cancels everything out. He's talking you through it with his headphones in, mm-hmm. and starts screwing around with it. And it, there it is, yeah. So his his friend actually comes to the bar, and uh, <laughs> gets a beer and carries on singing. So mm-hmm. that was really cool. But while he's live changing all the effects, okay, and it sounds really quite good. And yeah, it, they. LEDs, yeah, so it's got saturation and A and B on different uh, pedals, so there's two banks of stuff you can turn on and off with your feet. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I thought that was a funky new thing that's uh, coming out. 250 quid. Okay. Uh, which, for something like that, that's all analogue, and, ah, so yes, you can see he's putting other effects into the loops, and and that kind that's of... such a hipster pedal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The black and white thing, yeah. Just did the whole thing, it's like... Oh, yeah. Massive hipster. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, good microphone preamps are hard enough to find their pedal format anyway. Mm-hmm. And throwing all that cool stuff in there mm-hmm. means that if you go to a venue where they've got all that like, cheap Behringer stuff or whatever it is, you've already got a nice vocal sound before you start screwing around and having fun with your mm-hmm. band. I think that's a pretty cool little thing. Yeah. Um, if I was touring and gigging regularly again, like I have been up until recently, but I've stopped, I might consider spoiling myself with one of these at Christmas. But as it stands, I can't justify it in mm-hmm. the situation mm-hmm. I'm in because I've got a studio full of tools that do that mm-hmm. at my fingertips while somebody else does the singing part. Mm-hmm. But if it was me as a, a one-man unit... Mm-hmm. Unit. <laughs> yes. Or a singing unit, singing unit multi-man. Yes, an absolute singing unit. <laughs> then uh, I might consider one of these. Rick and Morty pedal. Yes. So from from the hipster 
to the ultra hipster. Okay. Do you remember the stylophone? Mm-hmm. Yeah, where you, you got like a pen came out the back of it and it mm-hmm. made one noise, that mm-hmm. kind of noise. Apparently there's now a, a, a six oscillator a massive synth sounding version of a stylophone. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Hipster much? Mm. Fully analog, semi modular synth. They're 300 quid. It's got, yeah, dual oscillators, uh, sub oscillators, and sub sub oscillators. Wow. So you can make. I heard you like subs with your sub, so I subbed your sub so you can <laughs> sub the sub sub. Yes. Yeah. Sounds good. I like it. And it's 300 quid for one of these. So if you want to be... Decent for analog synth? I mean... I suppose. But then, uh, if you think that's cool as an analog synth, and it's kind of small, then why not have... That's a synth. Okay. That's a 16... Is that just a channel. MIDI cable? Yeah, 16 voice. That's that's the whole thing. So that's a MIDI pin. That's a quarter-inch jack on the output. That's a that's a sixteen voice MIDI synth. Okay. How insane is that? So you plug it in. But how do you play? You get a keyboard with a MIDI out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you just plug it in, and that's it. It makes the sound out of that. That's mental. It's called Flash Synth from Tim Alex Jacobs. It takes its power from the MIDI jack. Okay. And yeah, you control the sounds, the actual sounds it makes via the MIDI. And yeah, so it can do 16 channels all at once. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, It produces as many bleeps and bloops as possible at 44 kilohertz. <laughs> and yeah, apparently this guy's made a business card stylophone before and stuff like that. <laughs> Etch-a-sketch USB mouse. Really stupid stuff. So... Other than being like a kind of cool gadget, what is the point of this? Or is that the point? That, I think that's mostly the point. Okay. But it, it does also mean that you could do things like if you had like a battery-powered MIDI keyboard or something like that, like controller keyboard, you could plug that into it while you're busking and get sounds out of that. And But you could also get a cheap keyboard from a charity shop. That's and do that like old school crappy keyboard. Like, is it is, does it sound good? I I don't know. Let's have a listen to the. Oh. It makes cool wibbly wobbly sounds. This isn't coming. This is only coming through the mic, by the way. Hello, everyone. Today we're talking. But. It does lots of cool, wi- Ooh. cool wibbly wobblies. Okay, yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah. It has got an analog feel to it. Yeah, well, it's, it's a proper Which, uh, analog synth. Yeah. yeah, okay. But in the size of your thumb. Hmm. Miniaturization of technology gone mad. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, okay. Uh, have I missed a bit here? What's that? Uh, I have. I, I keep missing this section. Uh, out of my little script. So earlier on, when I was talking about what was coming up tonight, um, <laughs> I'll just read this now for in the next 20 minutes. Uh, so after the telling you what we were going to talk about tonight, uh, then we're going on to the section of the show where we field questions from the audience about music production. So get your questions ready for about half an hour from now. Uh, but before we move on to the news, we already did. So, um, yes, um, uh, one of the guys in chat is asking questions, which is good, which is cool. Um, after we finish talking about the news, we're going to do that as a section. Mm-hmm. So, as always. Yes. So if we don't answer your question, we're not ignoring you. We're saving it for that section. Yeah, we go through and go through everyone's questions that aren't rude. Yes. Well, yes. <laughs> we're not inferring that you're rude, by the way. We're just. Oh pre- no, no, no. Pre- Previously, we've had yeah, yeah, people. Anyway, uh, yes. Uh, so yeah, I thought that was pretty crazy and worth mentioning. Uh, moving on, uh, Strymon. Strymon are very well known for their um, reverb and delay pedals, the Timeline and the Big Sky, which sound absolutely gorgeous and are very expensive for effects pedals, mm-hmm. uh, which means that a lot of like blues dad uh, guitarists have them, you know, the people who've got disposable cash mm-hmm. and just want the best. 
or the best uh, guitarists in the world quite often have them on stage because they can afford them. Mm -hmm. uh, Strymon have now done a full amp in a box with uh, an Im impulse response cab loader inside it. I've not had a chance to even hear a demo of one yet. They're that new. Uh, but apparently they're uh, trying to wrap world-class amps driving perfectly matched speaker cabinets in great sounding rooms by providing easy access to three iconic amplifiers, oh, just three, uh, with loadable impulse response speaker cabinets that complement the tonality of the amp and lush room ambience. So this is trying to do what two notes do in the pedal and their software into one box? Pretty much. Hmm? Uh, Seems legit. Yeah, um, if, well, if, if it's actually proper guitar amp simulation as well as the cab stuff, that could be interesting. Hey, I mean, I've had. I mean, it's not new. I mean, that old Boss, whatever eighty-eight pedal that I've got in there, that's got amp modeling on. It was amazing. Yeah, and it sounded fantastic. <laughs> Digital amp modeling for the nineties. Holy crap! Yeah, that's a blast from a past we don't want. Okay, yeah. this sounds like something that makes sense. To probably the next step from what we're seeing a lot of stuff out there at the moment. So. Yeah, it's combining what we've seen, which is like two notes do their le preamp pedals, mm -hmm. which are the whole preamp tube based thing and then they have their cab emulation which also handles the power ramp emulation so the mm -hmm. two of them together makes a preamp and a power amp and a cab which is kind of the holy trifecta of what makes a guitar amp sound the way it does mm -hmm. uh, and so how big it, is an impulse response file a few kilobytes mm. they're not that big in the end uh, when you're generating them, you're using sine wave sweeps. They get quite big. They're several megabytes. But then at the end, to fold them into a thing that's usable, it does some clever maths. It spits out a tiny little file that's only a few kilobytes, really. So something like that, you could easily have a crap ton of them loaded onto memory. It depends on the, on the way the pedal's designed. Apparently this one can handle three. Okay. Uh, but that may very well be a design choice to keep it simple. Because... Uh, some of the pedals that Strymon make are very complicated under the hood. Uh, but I think feedback from a lot of their user base has been, we want more simplicity. Okay. Or at least more hands-on simplicity. Mm -hmm. Like If I was on stage, I don't really want a full menu of options. No. If I was on stage, I want to be able to go you know, 1x12, 2x12, 4x12, click a click. Mm-hmm. Because... Any other options are missing there that you'd, you'd want? Show dependent, mm -hmm. I would probably not use more than two, maybe three. Mm. No, I'm just thinking, do you think three is enough, or do you think they maybe should have tried to stretch it to a few more? I think for the application, that is maybe about right. Or okay. it, in terms of the cabs, definitely. In terms of the amps, that's a different thing. Um, I could easily use several amp sounds in a gig, but then it depends what you're doing. If you're in like a covers band and you do sounds of different bands... You probably do want several different amp sounds to yeah, try and chase. Then those. are you like better going like Axe FX sort of way, like if you want that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But if it's you're not in, quite that market, no, it's maybe where you're a session musician or you just want to turn up to a show and be able to give a cable out to the front house guy and go. So it kind of makes sense. So is this? This is just called the Iridium. Like, you imagine if say like if two notes did something where they have like the the bass, the crunch. All the different that are kind of like tonally kind of grouped. If you had one for so each of like a blues guitarist or a rock guitarist or bassist, you could maybe then group them that way, where then mm. you could maybe get away with a few amps. Or it still depends on. Maybe. No, you're still saying that you could do six in one gig, don't you? So. But that definitely depends on the, on the art and the guitarist. A lot of the time, guitarists have their sound. Mm. And I, I know, actually, that if, if I went out to play my own show, I'd probably only use a clean sound and a distorted sound. Mm -hmm. No, two distorted sounds, a rhythm and a lead. Although, depending on the amp sound I'm using, I might just use the same for both and just kick the rhythm sound in the face to get a heavy lead sound. Mm -hmm. It depends on what I feel like on the day. I know I'm, I'm a bit of an odd one like that because I, if I was to play with a different type of band, I would then tailor my sound to that band. Mm-hmm. I mean, as a bass player, I've definitely got my own sound, but as a guitarist, I usually get kind of... I, I get thrown in and I get, like, we're this kind of band, we need this kind of sound, go. And I go, okay! And it changes the way I play, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I don't know. 
I'd have to hear it because uh, apparently Strymon have done a distortion pedal that a lot of people actually quite like, okay. which isn't technically analog, but it sounds close enough that most people who aren't trying to look for flaws mm -hmm. just go, yeah, I like it. Mm -hmm. And then they look inside it and go, ooh, analog components? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I think that especially really well-designed digital stuff is getting to that level now mm -hmm. where unless someone tells you it's digital you don't necessarily want to look you just want it to sound good mm -hmm. where like you said the 90s amp in a box you just kind of go this sounds really sterile <laughs> now it sounds like bees <laughs> yeah I, yes so hmm Interesting. Uh, so it's it's got basically a Vox AC30, a Marshall Plexi, and a Fender Deluxe Reverb in there. Okay. None of which are particularly high gain amps, which no. again tells me the market this is aimed at. Yeah. This is definitely aimed at you kind of your blues crowd. Yeah, a lead, but that's about you're not going to go full on kind of metal with this, are you? Not without sticking a really high gain pedal in front of it. Mm-hmm. And even then, maybe. Well, it depends what you want to do. Like the Rev mm -hmm. G4 pedal, which I've got lying around here somewhere, that can turn any amp into a fire-breathing monster mm -hmm. and sounds fantastic. <laughs> uh, if A couple of times in the studio now, instead of going for... Like, I've got a PV6505 in the corner there, and sometimes it's not right. Sometimes I'll get the clean sound on one of the Marshalls and run the Rev through it and go, that's the sound. Mm -hmm. And pedals are getting that good now that sometimes they just do that mm -hmm. thing and you just go instead of going oh god it's a pedal no you go oh okay because mm -hmm. that thing it, it's it got an, a switch for a, aggression and on red mode it's basically corn in a box mm -hmm. it's really good but yeah I mean, this this is not that but that rev pedal doesn't sound good just taking the output straight from it from it straight into a mixing desk or something mm -hmm. like that. It's designed to go into an amp, which mm -hmm. is relatively clean, but not completely. Because mm -hmm. the, the amp's supposed to have a little bit of give and take. Even mm -hmm. when it's clean, most amps are not truly clean. No. If they were clean, they'd be boring as yeah, hell. Yeah, they had a bit of flavour to it. And yeah. And it's that whole interaction of even the clean tubes and the power tubes and the speaker and all of it does this organic thing that even when you distort the hell out of it, Instead of it going, it goes big and sound, and you go, ooh, big sound. Mm -hmm. And it's that thing that makes you grin. <laughs> Should we move on? We've still got a yes. few to get through, haven't we? So. Yeah, so some of these we're not going to be uh, hanging on very much. Uh, this one I just wanted to laugh at. Like, ha! Um, Antelope Audio, who are um, a man manufacturer of interfaces, have added auto tune to their interfaces because. Antelope's interfaces are designed in such a way that they've got like real-time processing mm -hmm. on it on the way in. I just think this is really, really stupid. Okay. Because this now means that as well as getting the virtual microphone and virtual preamp sound, I can bake in auto-tune onto my recordings, which gives me no chance to go back and fix it. Mm-hmm. And it's all the only benefit is that it takes away a bit of the processing that the computer recording to has to do. Mm -hmm. I know just how little processing power Auto Tune uses, and that's a good thing for Antares because low CPU usage is a great thing. Mm -hmm. And that means I've had, without exaggerating, on a quad core processor, which is kind of middling at best now in the computer world, I've had sixteen channels of backing vocals all with Auto Tune on them. Mm -hmm. And then compressors, EQs, and all the rest. And the, the process is not broken out in a sweat. Mm -hmm. Why mm. would I need this? And um, the other thing is, if I then decide, actually, you know what? Auto tune probably wasn't the right thing there. I just turn them all off. Mm -hmm. When it's baked in like this, you can't turn it off because it's. That was my least favourite thing about the original Antares Auto Tune hardware, which I used once, is if I decided afterwards it wasn't what I wanted. Tough. So this is hardware? No, this is... Um, it runs on the interface on its own processor. Oh, right. So, yeah. The, oh, like the old Focusrite thing. Yes. Yeah. 
kind of like that. It's got an FPGA in, if you know what FPGAs nope. are. An FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Array, is it's kind of like a CPU, but the clever thing about an FPGA is you can completely rewire it through software. Okay. They're very clever. They're quite expensive because of that. Mm-hmm. But you can update the processor itself. You can change the way it works. Okay. You can literally download updates that change the way that the processor processes. I used to have an old RME uh, USB interface that had an FPGA in. And when it was designed back in about 2009, it was an original baby face, iPads weren't a thing. Mm -hmm. iOS wasn't a thing. And so a few years down the line, iPads become the thing that you can do audio production on. Mm -hmm. But interfaces have to have this mode called class compliant mode, Mm -hmm. which has to be built into the hardware. So anything before when that was made and standardized literally wouldn't work with an iPad. Mm -hmm. RME gave you a a downloadable firmware update that rewrote the entire processor Mm -hmm. to add in class compliant mode. So literally the processor then had the thing in it. (laughs) That's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah, so it's really clever, which means that any updates, you, you can, if if the FPGA wasn't capable of that, as long as it has the actual computing horsepower for it, mm-hmm. it can literally be redesigned on the fly. Mm-hmm. Very clever. That's but pretty cool. This is just, in my opinion, not the best application for that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. No. Yeah. No, I... I'm with you on this one. I, I don't have an argument against it. Well, I'm in favour of it even. In in general, I'm not a, f- a fan of this type of processing. Uh, I'm not a fan of any type of processing that doesn't just go on your computer CPU these days. Uh, and that's a question that's in the chat, and I think we'll come back to it at the end because he's talking about UAD, which is the big one of these. It has been since... I started recording but yeah we'll come back to talking about that because it's in the chat so that we'll we'll talk about in it's relevant section mm-hmm. so um, NME have said uh, My Chemical Romance are coming back I don't know if they're back back or if they're just doing a show together because they want to because mm-hmm. why not uh, but he yeah stopped making uh, TV shows for Netflix then I don't know if he stopped or if he's just fil- finished filming a series and is very rich and bored. <laughs> now it's a place of music again. Yeah, well, they've all been making music, to be fair. Uh, Frankie Arrow's made three albums. Uh, Mikey Way's made uh, an an album of his own. Uh, Gerard Way's made a solo album. Mm-hmm. Uh, they all have. Uh, so they've all been musicking, but they've not been forced by the record label to live in a box and punch each other. <laughs> Which apparently the kind of things that happened with by the end of their tenure as My Chemical Romance they mm-hmm. all hated each other because the record label insisted that they tour and stay in the same box mm-hmm. you know uh, so anyway um, they put some some iconography on their, their website to kind of tease it mm-hmm. and then usually you know you get a couple of days people you know, for time for it to virally spread now an hour later they just dropped it <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, tickets are on sale Friday. Uh, the show's on December 20th, which means it's, what, seven weeks away? Cool. So they've just gone, okay, we're going to do a show in LA. Good luck getting tickets. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> all the all the 15-year-old emo girls who are no longer 15 <laughs> are all going to be scrambling. Mm. And I actually do hope that they, they make more music. And I'd be interested to see what it'd make now when they grow up because I think bands like that, as they mature, <clears throat> either go into complete douchery and make the worst music ever yeah. or make something really interesting yeah. and use all that talent and experience and angst that they had and turn it like again, I've probably mentioned already, but Blink 182's album 9 I think is absolutely incredible. Yeah. And it's a really mature version of their old sound mm. and it's really interesting how they've evolved whilst also still sounding like the same band. Yet you've got bands like. And it's a personal preference, but um, Thrice, for instance, they yeah. have matured into a completely different band. And it's interesting, and if you like that thing, but it's different. So it'd be interesting to see where where they've gone, mm. if they do come back. Yeah. Because um, originally, because I've got their first album, which most people think is the um, the one before Black Parade, but that was actually their second no. album. Yes. Because um, no one really knew the first one, because that was really raw. 
Yeah, and I re- thought it sucked. <laughs> oh, I really liked it. Um, Vampires Will Never Hurt You, I think, was one of the songs oh. on there. It was really raw and quite punky, really. Yeah. Um, and then the big one with the I'm Not Okay is yeah. what when they like get onto crying and got it was very poppy which was definitely my favourite one. Oh yeah me too 100% Black Parade was alright but they actually, went up their own I, I say that I, I still listen to Black Parade every yeah, now and again thing is if you take the iconography out of Black Parade mm-hmm. yeah. and all the hype it's just a really good blues rock album yeah don't watch any of the videos yeah I like the videos as oh, well I separately I but I, I've always been a prog rock fan I mm-hmm. like Theme, yeah, 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 themes and iconography mm-hmm. and art, overarching pompousness. Mm-hmm. I just like stupid stuff like that. But yeah, musically, if you just turn everything off and just drive and just listen, it's just like a really good swinging rock album. Cool. Teenagers is a hell of a three minute rock song. Yeah. Stuff like that. But yeah, they got so much grief for their imagery and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. which ironically black parade was supposed to be uh, a complete 180 on their previous image mm. and then so then they went and he did the red hair thing and they went all semi kind of dancey for trying to turn the back on that and do mm-hmm. a, a david bowie type thing and it came across as just oh i've got a red fringe for my email now <laughs> oh dear anyway anywho um, this seems really interesting to me. Uh, Slayer's Kerry King, who has uh-huh. used BC Rich guitars forever, has joined Dean Guitars. Okay. I mean, the the reasons that this is interesting to me. Firstly, Slayer are coming to the end of their farewell tour. Mm-hmm. So why would he bother at this point? Is mm. my first question. And Money. This, this maybe, but. Uh, I wouldn't have thought they were doing particularly badly with a back catalogue like they've got. Mm. And if they're finishing their farewell tour, their major expenditure's about to end. And also the major income. Gigging is... Yes, you got royalties, but gigging will still make them the most money. Maybe, but they've been around 30-plus years. Surely their TV and film sync must have some decent money coming in at this point. I wouldn't mind betting his house is paid for. Yeah, no, but some people just like money. Maybe. But my question is not why Dean Guitars, because Dean Guitars are okay. My question is what's wrong with BC Rich? What's gone wrong there? Mm, yeah, I mean, that could also be the thing. He's fallen out with someone and said, fuck you. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, it's going to be a wild ride for years to come. Maybe he's got other projects on the go that are not necessarily Slayer because... Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, ooh, they're, they're starting it off with a limited run of 50 handcrafted USA models. Mm. So that's the thing, yeah. Um, Dave Mustaine from Megadeth used Dean guitars, I think he still does, for quite a while. But he was a, a massive Jackson user for years, and then mm-hmm. they must have had a fallout. Speaking of whom, next news article, Dave Mustaine. And his Dean guitars and other guitars, he's selling most of his stuff. You used to love Megadeth, didn't you? I did. I still kind of do. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember as a kid, I never like I'd never heard of Megadeth until thirteen-year-old you was listening to Megadeth in the common room or whatever. Yeah, and you're like Megadeth. I was like, what the hell's a Megadeth? <laughs> <laughs> that sounded, like I don't know. Like now it sounds like a band, but by then it sounded so lame to me. I was like, what's Megadeth? I've been listening to Megadeth since I was about two years old. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I remember my dad getting Rust in Peace in 1990, and he wouldn't shut up about it because. Yeah, he just put it on and I was just like, ah! <laughs> as a little kid. And oh, I'll never forget the story. Uh, my mum and dad went to see Megadeth the year after that, which was the Countdown to Extinction tour, which Countdown to Extinction is the album that went to number two in the American charts because it got beaten that week by Metallica's Black Album. <laughs> what a week for rock. <laughs> yes, but if you know the story behind uh, Dave Mustaine from Megadeth used to be in Metallica and got kicked out. Oh, yeah, 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 of course, yeah. That was one of his most bitter moments. Yeah. Because he always wanted to prove uh, Metallica wrong. Yeah, oh yeah, and I've forgotten that, yeah. If they'd managed to release that album a week earlier, he might have been able to say, I got number one first. <laughs> but no. Ouch. Yeah. Anyway, um, uh, Dave's not been doing too well recently. He's, he's had uh, treatment for uh, some kind of, of cancer, which apparently he's doing well from. He's recovered. Good. He's Yeah, he's, he's more than on the mend. But it, it may be what's made him stop and think uh, about... Because he's apparently got hundreds of guitars and amps that he's collected over the years. Mm-hmm. 
And this seems to be, yeah, he's currently undergoing treatment for throat cancer. Apparently, he, yeah, he said that he's doing well. It's gonna be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, they caught it early. He's going through early stage treatment, all that kind of stuff. Good stuff. Great. Uh, but what he said, the long and short of it was, it's the kind of thing that's made him think. Um, a lot of stuff that he'll never play again. It's stuff like prototypes where, you know, um, a guitar company like if he's working with Dean, they might send him four different versions of his new signature guitar to choose, yeah, to play them all. They're slightly different and go, that's the one. Mm -hmm. Make this, and then the other three don't get played because mm -hmm. they weren't perfect for him in mm -hmm. the first place. Despite mm -hmm. the fact they may well be perfectly good guitars, mm -hmm. they're an exercise in commerce, I guess. Mm -hmm. Any he, so he's got stuff like that and amps and a lot of it isn't particularly um, rare. Like he's got an Akai recorder there. There's a, a Zoom effects pedal, the Dave Mustaine edition, uh, which seems pretty cool. Uh, it's got a a Marshall power amp there, and stuff that that is kind of cool. Oh, apparently he's got a P Cells drum kit. Don't know why he's got that as the non drummer, but that's cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I had money, I'd buy that. That's cool. <laughs> but yeah, he's got all this uh, stuff. Like, there's some nice guitars, like the oh, silver V prototypes. So he's, I don't know if he's paying his medical bills, which I would imagine, let's be honest, they're probably not cheap if he's got something going on like this and he's a US citizen. No. Because being the man he is with the history that he's had with, apparently he's a born again Christian, he's Mr. Clean now, but he used to be the wild child mm -hmm. and I would imagine a lot of uh, medical uh, insurance companies in the US wouldn't have touched him with a 10 foot barge pole. Mm -hmm. So it... I w I'm hoping that a lot of this is going to go to charity, uh, but even if it doesn't, hell, he's just selling his stuff. <laughs> if I could afford it, I would. It's a really, really cool garage sale. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, David Gilmore from Pink Floyd did that a little while back. He literally looked in one of his storage rooms and went, I don't need all this. <laughs> uh, I don't want to pay for storage anymore. And then, because he's got a lot of money, he just sold it all through Christ Christie's charity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he, whichever charity it was, he literally just said, have it, make money, charity, good. Um, but I don't know if Dave needs the money more. I, I don't know. I don't want to speculate. No. We wish him well. We do. Uh, so, talking of selling guitars, was it last week or a week, couple of weeks ago? Yep. Talked about Kurt Cobain's Mustang being up for sale. Mm -hmm. We reckoned it might go for a quarter of a million. Mm -hmm. Went for 340 grand. Wow. So, way over that estimate. That is a musical whale right there. Yeah. I'd turn it upside down and restring it right-handed right and mm -hmm. play it at every possible opportunity. <laughs> Probably play Nirvana a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah. I'd get a couple of boss pedals and a Marshall stack in my <laughs> front room and just be like, wah, 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 play the Come As You Are solo five mm -hmm. times a day. <laughs> That's what, <laughs> that is why the first amp I had was a Marshall and the first pedal I bought, bought was a DS1 or a DS2. Yeah. For exactly that reason. <laughs> Still got that DS2 kicking about. Yes, isn't it? Yeah. I keep meaning to get that out because I've heard a couple of demos recently of people using a DS2 into a really nice amp. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like a beast. Mm -hmm. And that's why he used it, because he had a really expensive Marshall stack. Mm -hmm. And most of us all had tr a rubbish practice. And you don't amps. have to set it to 11 as well. Like If you set it no. to like 3 or 4, it gives a really nice drive. Oh, on turbo mode, it'll mm -hmm. melt your face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't need, Yeah, you're right. You need the drive on about 3, and you're like, whoa, dude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Um, Last but not least, we like to laugh at Gibson here <laughs> on the hot pole position. So, um, they. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> wah, wah, wow. Yeah, they lost the trademark for the Gibson Flying V a few years back in Europe. And now they've been trying to talk about. Oh, format supported, no signal. Awesome. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Puppy power. Oh. I think this cable's just starting to go. That should fix it. He says. 
Strange. Uh, the Elgato is not the most reliable capture device, but it's uh, being a pain. Oh, this HDMI cable's end is very squished. Let's just see. Or is it the other end that's gone? Well, I think we'll be alright, to be honest. Like, yeah. People have seen the photo of it, they can still see us. We can go back to full screen. Uh, no device. One Ooh. moment, please. Oh, no momento. Well, yeah. So, anyway. Yes, uh, may as well just read it out first, you guys. It wouldn't be the hot pole position without a small technical hitch. Should we go full screen? Full screen. The screen of falls. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, they lost the Flying V, oh, back in June of this year. And mm -hmm. now the Firebird uh, shape. This means that uh, Chinese companies can now make copies without fear of reprisal. Uh, the reason, apparently, that they cancelled it is that Gibson waited 50 years to try and <laughs> go for a copyright. So the EU courts have just gone, well, if you weren't bothered for that long, it's obviously not that important to you. D denied. They're having a good time of it, really, are they? Not particularly. No, well, this this is the whole what goes around comes around thing. It's mm -hmm. just taken a while to set in motion because mm -hmm. as such a big company, I think there's a certain amount of inertia involved mm -hmm. where if you do something really stupid when it's this big, it just takes this long to bite you. Mm -hmm. But it does bite you. And I think if Gibson were doing really well, news articles like this would just sail on by and mm -hmm. just they'd be at the bottom footnote and they'd just almost go unnoticed and but because everyone's piling on Gibson because of some of the disastrously bad PR they've had over the last few years it stands out as uh, another wop wop because it was it was Gibson that were going after the smaller companies for copying their guitars wasn't it yes yeah and now the courts are basically saying oh right yeah no you don't even own this fuck yeah, off exactly yeah you don't even own this guitar shape <laughs> yeah so that's what happened to McDonald's in Ireland as well with the Big Mac. Remember? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> you try and shit on the little guys. Sometimes people in the course will <laughs> fuck you over back. Absolutely. So um, that is this week's news. Uh, as we move into our viewers' questions segment, which is next, I was to mention briefly that we have an affiliate link with DistroKid. DistroKid can get your music published on iTunes, Spotify, and loads of other destinations within a matter of hours, if not days. If you want to publish covers, they can handle all the licensing stuff associated with that, as well for a dollar a month per song. Uh, if you use our link in the description below, you get a few percent off, and we get a kickback off that. They're easily the best publishers we've used. Um, I've got my own music online through them, and it was so much easier than anyone else that we've used. Check out DistroKid now. Well... Or later. Yeah, or, uh, yeah, after the end of the video. Yeah, sure. Stick around for a few minutes. So, uh, it is viewers' question time, ladies and gentlemen. If you're watching and you have a music tech-related or tangentially-related question that you'd like to ask, uh, now's a good time to get them in. We've got a couple already in the chat, so we'll... I've got one. You said about we're streaming on Mixer now. What do you think about Mixer? Have you heard of big news about Mixer this week? Shrewd? Shroud. Shroud. And um, uh, Goth, who's a big Destiny streamer. You, you know, it confused the heck out of me. Um, last week, it must it must have been it must have been almost exactly a week since Shroud joined because mm -hmm. I was setting up Mixer last week uh, for our, our first Mixer broadcast, mm -hmm. and it went to the home page and it was the loading screen for Shroud. Mm -hmm. I just went, hmm, is he dual streaming? Mm -hmm. But I was too busy with setting this up for last week and just carried on. But. It's only since that it's really they, kind of gone. I was reading about it. They rumoured that Ninja <coughs> got 20 million to move. Shroud wouldn't have got much less. Mm. Shroud's big. And so far, he's doing better on the platform than Ninja is. As the suggestion maybe is that a lot of Ninja's um, fans are on PlayStation. Ah. Uh, playing Fortnite on PlayStation. It's obviously very big on that. Mm. But Shroud is PC, really, based. Yes. So he's going to gain audience through Xbox rather mm. than anything else. Yeah. Uh, and Goth is just a really sort of... He's not a variety streamer. He plays a lot of Destiny, um, but he's a lot more family-friendly. Mm. So they've got basically three of the top, say, 20. The top two in Shroud and Ninja, and then Goth's probably like somewhere in the top 20 from uh, Twitch. That has got to be a big part of Twitch's bottom line. Yeah. Gone. 
It's interesting to see what's going to happen with Mixer. Mm. It's going to be interesting going forward. Especially because, say, it's been a gaming platform, but, say, Twitch have uh, moved and brought in other elements. Say, we're streaming on, on all the platforms, but it's interesting to see if Mixer picks up. Maybe we'll be streaming more and getting more of a viewership on Mixer. It's really interesting, given that it's baked into Xbox. Um, I'm intrigued. Mm. I'm intrigued. Yes. All right, should we get to questions? Yes. Other questions? So, from Sebastian5. Uh do you want to read them out? Uh, sure. Uh, I own a UAD2 with at least half of the plugins. Brackets spend nearly millions. Mm, they are expensive. Um, but now I'm actually wondering, is it really worth it? Now, I've this is this is a uh, this is one of those questions where people have strong opinions. Wait, so, and so I, millions I, of pounds on plugins? No. Okay. It, nearly millions, as in just thousands. Okay, good. I was just checking. It, yeah, it feels like millions because, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so my side of the fence, I am firmly... <laughs> Marty's just turned up. Yeah, it's not like at all new. No. <laughs> um, I am firmly anti-UAD. Uh, not against the people there, I'm sure they're lovely. Ooh. I'm sure they're great. foreboding music here now. dum 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 and, and I'm not against Universal Audio either, which is the parent company. Mm-hmm. Uh, UAD, the thing, this is this comes this is what comes back to what we we're talking about before about things like FPGAs mm-hmm. and uh, dedicated processing, basically dedicated processing of any kind. Mm-hmm. So there's there's the big three at the moment. Now Antelope Audio are the third biggest with their FPGA stuff in their interfaces. Uh, UAD. Uh, make these processors the UAD used to just be uh, PCI Express cards and PCI cards that went into computers that offloaded all the processing onto the cards Uh, now there's things they have their interfaces called the Apollo interfaces which have that in built Mm -hmm. and also their satellites which like the Thunderbolt Mm -hmm. externals so if you've got a laptop like a Mac you can still do that and offload all the processing Mm -hmm. and number one for those who haven't thought about it this way, is Pro Tools HD. Pro Tools HD, and the reason it was always so damn expensive, is it came with these big, massive cards mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. where all the processing for all the audio channels was done on those cards. Now, mm, 10 years or so, maybe, just as a rough ballpark figure, I can see why they all existed. I get mm-hmm. it. It made sense at the time. It made a lot of sense at the time. We did it with video with the Matrix card. We did. A roughly that roughly that time frame mm-hmm. ago. Yeah. Because at the time, uh, pro- processors, CPUs, both the Mac power PCs at the time and the Intel you know, Pentium 4 and even the early Core 2 Duos and Core 2 Quads couldn't do nearly enough. Mm-hmm. And they certainly couldn't do it fast enough. No. Nope. Not for real time audio, or, or even video. Uh, yeah, you could ex you could export in real time uh, a H seven twenty HD file using the Matrix card. Without it, it was at least ten times that yeah. on a processor, and that yeah. was with a kick ass processor. So I think we're going back into the whole AMD thing. So I had the that the first AMD quad core that came out um, that was pretty bitching at the time. Um, I had to I ran that through the matrox because without it it just took days to render stuff yeah and it ran in real time so we, we've both had experience of that kind of stuff but where at the time that made a lot of sense uh not only have computers general processors got more and more and more and exponentially more powerful but the uh processing adding cards haven't mm-hmm uh, I know that Pro Tools may now make their um, PCI Express HDX cards, which mm-hmm. are ten times as powerful as the old HD mm-hmm. cards. Uh, literally ten times as powerful, which makes sense considering how long it took them between generations that mm-hmm. there would be uh, a, a, a leap that's an order of magnitude. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then so of CPUs. Mm-hmm. All the native processing of whatever format, whether it be Pro Tools or VST based stuff, any of that, is just as efficient, if not more so, 
th- than anything you can buy separately. And value for money as well. Like, value for I mean, money how much is one of these things? A lot. Um, so the the satellites they they can be five hundred to a thousand dollars, depending on how many cores you get on that. I think you upgrade your processor by a thousand dollars. What are you get out of that? I mean, and that if you update if if you upgrade your processor by a thousand dollars, that translates to every program you use. Yeah. Whereas the the stuff that's dedicated hardware does one thing and one thing only, mm-hmm. and it it's a closed market. It's it's a captive system with something like UAD. They don't have to reduce their prices because you can't buy their plugins from anybody else. Mm-hmm. Whereas there's a healthy competition going on in mm-hmm. the native plugin market. Prices mm-hmm. are much more reasonable, not because things are cheaper sounding, but because they have to be reasonable with their prices, mm-hmm. most of these companies, and that's where waves are failing badly, mm-hmm. because they have to stay competitive. Um uh, this is a very similar to argument argument to why I've used Reaper for a long time instead of Pro Tools. People said that because Reaper was you know, a tenth of the price of Pro Tools, it must be a tenth as good. Mm-hmm. That's never an argument that's held water with me. Mm-hmm. Um, if it was a tenth as good, you can bet your bottom dollar I wouldn't have used it. Um, if it wasn't half as good, I wouldn't wouldn't have used it regardless of price. Do you still have? Can you still use Reaper without paying? Yeah, yeah, forever. For I mean, personal use. Yeah, I mean, after 60 days, you should buy it, and you should feel bad if you don't, but it but, won't stop. But it won't stop working, yeah. like um, WinRAR. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's the WinRAR of the audio industry. Yeah, which, which again then gives it a, um, a certain view in the marketplace of its freeware sort of thing, as opposed to the premium element of something else. Yeah. So I think that adds to it as well. And... Um, I. So Sebastian Five says a lot of the UAD plugins are now available as separate plugins, as in native plugins, which isn't kind of what I was getting at there. But that's a story in and of itself that a lot of the plugins that UAD make, they now also make not for their own hardware, mm-hmm. which means they must be realizing to a certain point how much just having stuff in a closed system mm-hmm. isn't healthy for them. Mm-hmm. But the big problems for me is I never want to be locked into an ecosystem Mm -hmm. and the problem with the uad stuff is that if i unplug my uad device and take my laptop with me somewhere i can't do anything while i'm out because i don't have that piece of hardware with me Mm -hmm. i'm essentially frozen out of what i was doing i found that i've been looking through some old files from video projects um and i don't have a matrix card so some of the files we can't i can't play anymore because you need the codex from it there is a Matrox VFW codec that's yeah. Windows. There probably will be, there will be, but in terms of easing, and I now have to go and install that. It's proprietary. You have got to find it, and see if it's relevant. I see your point. Yeah, it's not as simple no, as yeah, a all... universal system like you're yeah. talking about. Yeah, you can find ways around them quite often, but it's not what you want. That's yeah. So I my projects in Reaper or even in Pro Tools are entirely native, which means I can take as long as I take a folder with all my samples which is just a folder of files, I can open it on a friend's computer on the other side of the world. I don't really have to worry about what computer they have. I don't have to worry too much about the specs. I just load the project up Mm -hmm. and it goes. Mm -hmm. If they've got a different interface to me, fine. If they've got uh, different plugins, they're missing plugins that I have, I can just install them generally, just use my iLock and go. And an iLock is something that I can hang off my little finger, so I don't mind carrying that around. Mm-hmm. Whereas, yeah, I'm I'm locked in with UAD, so I don't. And it's the same with Pro Tools HDX. I was looking for an alternative years ago, and that's why I spent quite a lot of money at the time on a really expensive, really state-of-the-art PC that could handle loads of plugins mm-hmm. and really expensive state-of-the-art interface that could do really low latency which is what Pro Tools HDX could do Mm -hmm. without Pro Tools HDX Mm -hmm. which means that then if somebody comes in the studio and says I have a Cubase project I can open it if I have a Reaper project I can open it and so on and so on and so on and so on and I'm not then having to be bound to one ecosystem Mm -hmm. and so that's a big deal for me and that's that's even a side of price Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah if if it was me, mm. 
I would be, and I certainly don't want to put words in somebody's mouth, but if it was me, I would at this point put the UAD hardware down to the sunk cost fallacy and sell it on. Uh, because we, yeah, we did that. Yeah, the, we we sold that and a mini DV deck at the same time. Mm. So on an eBay and lost a decent amount of money, but we used it and got a lot out of it. So yeah, yeah, I'd say I, yeah. If you feel that way, like obviously it's a personal decision, but there is an element of selling things before they come obsolete. Because now in a year later, we wouldn't be able to get a fraction because we got a decent amount of money for the Matrix card and the DV deck. But n- now you can pick them up for nothing. Yeah. Like twenty, like literally ten, twenty quid. Because nobody's using them now. Because the whole thing about the sunk cost fallacy, people mm-hmm. have gone well. You know, times have changed. Mm-hmm. Like in video production, now you get a copy of Premiere, you get a half decent Nvidia or AMD graphics card that does everything that the Matrox card yeah. used to do, which was then a bespoke system and is now, relatively speaking, a native system that's almost platform agnostic, mm-hmm. and it just works. Yep. And that's that's the future for me is, yeah, I've always backed the horse that is the most adaptable because that's what happens. Mm-hmm. Um, way back when we decided to abandon the Matrox card and go with Adobe Premiere without that, at the time, uh, you could only use NVIDIA graphics cards with that as the accelerators, and it was only a certain number. Do you remember mm-hmm. we bought, it was a GTX 470, mm-hmm. which was quite a big outlay at the time. And that was a monster, but I could see on the horizon that they were opening it up so that you could use pretty much anything. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was a list of these are all available now, and it added a few already, so yeah. Yeah, so that's what we went with. And we still do because it became more of an open system. There was never any intention of it being locked down. Mm -hmm. Whereas any system that's forever going to be locked down, like the UAD system, no, I wouldn't do that. Nope. Next question. Uh, Quickly, why use a Fairchild over any other compressor? What does the end consumer really hear in the difference? What do you think? Um... You should use... I mean, money no object in a studio. You should use a compressor for the sound it has uh, and the only way to really know is to use them uh, whether in software or whether in real life mm-hmm. um, Fairchilds are spoken about in hushed tones because they're bloody expensive because they're not only rare but they're like this big and they're like a steampunk machine mm-hmm. that's full of valves and transformers mm-hmm. and that in itself gives it a kind of a sound mm-hmm. Uh, because it's got something like... I'm not exaggerating when I say I think it's got 14 valves in this compressor and like seven transformers. And each one of those imparts a little bit of a sound. Mm -hmm. And so it just became a big part of the Nashville sound for some reason. When you hear really heavily compressed uh, country vocals, Mm -hmm. that's that sound. Mm -hmm. And also it's got some added... uh, What's the word? Um, weight, gravitas, because they're so rare and they're so damn expensive. Mm-hmm. And when they were made, they were expensive because of all the mm-hmm. bits involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I think that the end consumer can hear a difference if you're doing it properly, genre kind of appropriately, and if you're getting the most out of the thing, if if your intention was to get a track and barely touch it with a compressor just as a gentle bit of levelling, no one's going to hear the difference between that and any other compressor, really. But if you're really gunning the thing and really trying to squeeze the life out of it, mm-hmm. people tend to feel the difference then between something cheap and something that's made really well because you're getting the most out of it. Yep. The same can often be said for things like preamps. You know, people say, oh, Neve preamps are the best. Mm-hmm. I saw a, um, a couple of years back, Sound on Sound magazine did a preamp shootout between a Neve and SSL, a really cheap interface I remember one. This. Yeah. And they all sounded exactly the same. Yeah, I remember that. And the reason they sounded exactly the same is that the engineers had perfectly aligned them all to work right in the middle of the ideal operating range of those preamps. Because a preamp is designed to take a microphone, make it louder as cleanly as possible. That's that's the design brief on a preamp is mm-hmm. don't add noise, don't add distortion, don't do any of that stuff. Just make it louder and do it right. 
Now, when you push them way beyond that limit, interesting things start to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's where the cheap interfaces fall apart and the Neve Mm -hmm. ones sound really nice Mm -hmm. um, in a way that they were never intended to, but they do. Mm -hmm. Much like distortion on early guitar amps, they Mm -hmm. were never designed for it, but if you crank it, you go, oh, that's kind of cool. Similar thing. And that's that's when you get the most out of something is when you really start to crank. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if that's not your style, then maybe don't worry about it so much Mm -hmm. I do like to crank things like compressors so for me I don't necessarily get cork sniffery about oh this revision of a compressor that revision but yeah okay next one Um, uh, Dennis Akaya Uh, my question is what are the best practices to make an in-ear mix while recording maybe you have a video about that I might check out if you have any pretty show we've definitely talked about this on the podcast before yes and i have mentioned this briefly in a video about drum recording and the best uh the best way to hear yourself drum recording um i it's um a mix for recording like a tracking mix is not the same as a mix for Mm -hmm. the um what you call it uh, as a mix that oh oh uh, <laughs> um, bear with me a minute the uh producer that he mentioned who cannot be named has uh was meant as uh, just skyped so he's someone to reply to him not to be rude okay <laughs> Um, um, I think, I mean, best practices, I think the main thing is being able to hear whatever is the most important to you in the moment. Right, um, Warren says yes. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to add someone into this podcast. This is going to be interesting. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hiya. Hi, Warren Hewitt, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Hello. Hey. This, is, this is my best friend, Liam, who's also my business manager. Hello. How are you doing? I am best friend and business manager. How are you? I'm good, yes. sir. How are you? Yeah, we, the the Hot Pole Position podcast is currently live on a YouTube. You can just about see him on the screen in the back. Well, I'm, I'm sipping a cup of PG Tips. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm just going to try and add you. We've got a nice flash black magic camera there. We I'm do indeed. Envious. Oh, yeah, you can, see, you can see behind the screen the other way, yeah. <laughs> oh, That's quite flash. flash. Yeah, well, um... <laughs> Yeah, we've done video production for I mean, me and Adam together for the past kind of, 10, 15 years, so uh, it's a big part of what we've been doing as well. So, yeah, so... What, yeah, cam- cam- what camera do you have on your laptop or wherever you're streaming from? Because that's really high quality. That is, that's the Black Magic. That's feeding through to a capture card in the PC. Uh, the one that you can see on Skype is yeah, yeah. the uh, Logitech C920. That's nice. Yeah, they're really good. For for a little um, webcam, like the ridiculous quality. Well, it's funny you throw some lights up and everything looks nice. <laughs> <laughs> True. True. We're just we're just, we're just quite, quite punk rock because I, I, I you know I'm I'm, I'm like, like I don't re- I haven't stopped, haven't stopped working. working like I'm mixing uh, an, album an album at the moment and finishing up a couple, couple more, more and, and so I'm always, I'm always like trying to juggle and do YouTube, YouTube videos, videos and content, and content in, the in the middle of all the other things that I do. So. Yeah. Insane. I need to get better at uh, uh, some of the video stuff, you know. <laughs> if you want any tips, I'm sure we can uh, get together and give you a few. <laughs> hey, I have all ears. <laughs> it's funny that it's kind of that we we came into it the complete opposite way. That we we were video production first. Well, Liam was video production first and taught me the reins, but I've always been the studio guy. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah. So how, where, are, where are you? Are you in Manchester? Where about are you? Yeah, we're just east of Manchester in a little town called Ashton Underline. There's a massive IKEA, and in its shadow, we are in what used to be a big old British pub. 
Oh, you're inside an old pub? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is the old beer cellar that we converted. Uh, when we bought the pub, it was still had all the beer pumps on the walls. Uh, and we spent what, about two years converting the, the basement. So it's completely nice. isolated from the outside. It's uh, completely dead. Very That's cool. fantastic. So you're streaming live on YouTube. So let's 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 have a look. Yeah. Yeah. The chat. The chat. So currently, the chat is telling that um, they're saying hi. Uh, apparently, um, yeah, you one of some one of our favourites by one Marty says. So yeah. Oh, lovely. Uh, <laughs> let me see if I can find find us. <laughs> so I can see the chat as well. Yes. So if you find Hot Pole Studios, we, well, you should, it should be the top one live now. <laughs> lovely. If it, if it's, so, uh, so, 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 not talking about music. So, Manchester is that? Uh, are, are you uh, are you Manchester United or City fans? <laughs> mixed. Yeah. Oh, mixed. Oh, you're split. Oh, god, that must yeah. that must create some havoc. It's funny we don't talk about football very much because you know in it's it's usually you know music or football in in this town. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, Liam's a diehard United fan, and I'm. Uh, I used to work at Main Road for for City, so. Oh wow! Yeah. yeah, we've stayed friends for the last twenty years, but we haven't spoken about football. Maybe that's part of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we keep that so, off. So I just did, just did Hot, Pulse Hot Pulse Studio, Studio and... and something else came up that had nothing to do with music. Oh, bizarre. <laughs> Right, okay. Um, there we go. I'm trying to get your audio through without it causing a hideous triple echo. Uh, oh, yeah. Do you want me to put, want on, to put on earbuds? earbuds? Uh, it's not on your side. It's because we're live streaming and I, we, we can hear you through the speakers, which are then feeding into the, our mic. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Uh, but that's just a... Uh... Sorry, guys. You'll just have to live with that, I'm afraid. <laughs> with it being uh, right, a, right. Last, a very last minute thing. <laughs> it's driving it's everybody, driving everybody nuts. nuts. I'm sure being audio nerds, it's driving them all insane. But well, that's 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 the one thing, isn't it? It's like one of the things that's really frustrating about, or just not frustrating, but a reality with with doing YouTube and stuff is like, um, and like I was saying, most of what we do is pretty punk rock. We'll sort of turn up somewhere, like you know, with a couple of clip-on mics and do an interview with somebody in a studio tour and. You know, there's yeah, dropouts drop and, and all kinds of stuff. stuff. And people are like, oh, the, the audio is, you're, you're professionals. I'm like, well, sort of. I mean, I'm an audio professional, but there's only so much you can do with a handheld camera, you know what I mean? And <laughs> Very different kind of professional, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, like, it's a, like a, 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 maybe we should hire a film crew wherever we go. There you go. <laughs> well, you had that problem with the the, the most successful uh, video on the channel was something that Adam did just as a one-off doing a, a demo on Reaper. Yes. And it, that wasn't perfect by any means because you didn't expect it to sort of take off. And that had issues and stuff. And that became a yeah. comment on that video with several hundred thousand views and people saying, well, if you're yeah. going to be a professional, why is this not recorded properly? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's why I went back and re-recorded it earlier this year because yeah. it became the biggest one on the channel. So I thought, you know what, let's do this right. Let's make a real series. Mm -hmm. And that seems to have paid off. <laughs> Good. But, Good. Yeah, we've got so much more in the works and never quite enough time to do it all. I, I can I only can imagine. imagine. Um, um, so how so long have you been doing, been doing it? it? Oh, about 450 videos in. So, so five great, years great. or so. Oh wow! Yeah, wow. yeah. So we've been doing it a while, and and we we were in media for another five years before that. So yeah, we've been. Uh, it's one of those things that one day I just sat down in what was just finished was this studio, and I said, "We've got all these cameras, we've got all these microphones. Why are we not doing this?" Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, and I mean, Adam is the sort of person that when he starts talking about audio production, never wants to stop. So giving him a camera and a, a, a world to talk to seemed like a good way, use of his time. Just put him in the corner with a the camera. There you go, Adam. Talk to the internet instead. Yeah. So well, I, I, I hear you. I, hear you. I, I, totally I totally understand. I mean, I said, I said yesterday in an interview, somebody was interviewing me and I said, I can talk for 20 minutes about something I should talk about for 30 seconds and I can talk about something for 30 seconds that I should be talking about for 20 minutes. It's just, it's just the way I am. Quite often we'll ask a question of somebody and, and, and the tangents are pretty hilarious where we can go. But, but, I also, I also feel like, feel like not being, being a professional, a professional uh, interviewer, interviewer is probably, probably actually, actually not a bad, bad thing. thing because how many times have you watched 
a professional interview, interview and just been like, been like God, God, I wish they, I wish they would they ask more common sense, sense questions. questions. Yeah. Because most, most, most of the time they, they ask questions, questions that you already know the answer, answer to just because they're giving the person a platform to, to you know, talk about themselves. I'd much rather have like a normal conversation like this and witness it, you know. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's where you actually, you're completely right. You can find out more interesting things about b both people or about things just in their lives. You say the tangents can be the most in interesting things sometimes, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, like uh, Michael, like Michael Gunderson, Gunderson says, says, waffle on Warren. Warren. There you go. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, but even before we were doing this as a YouTube channel, we would go out and interview bands. We had an online magazine, so... I think uh, I didn't do the interviews very much at the time, but my crowning achievement at the time is I'm a huge Dream Theater fan, and I got to interview Mike Portnoy at a particular gig, and I was shaking like a leaf. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. I, look, I, 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 if you've seen any of my videos, every, it, there's usually this joke made: is like, how long can Warren go before he mentions Queen? Well, I've been on for <laughs> for, for six minutes, and I've mentioned Queen. So, yeah. but. <laughs> I, uh, I, it was, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. It was when my son was super little. So it was like 10 years ago, and I was coming out of a movie theater in L.A. I can't remember what movie it was. I was coming out with my wife and my son, and I walk out, and there is Brian May standing, like, you know, 10 yards in front of me as I walk out the door. And he must have been with his son because they looked identical, and they both were super tall and skinny. And I'm just like... <laughs> I just and and I have some ins. I, I we have a couple of mutual friends. I've never met him before. I suppose I could have gone up there, but as I was walking towards him, I just was like, you know, as we say in England, I just bottled out. I was like, do would I really, you know, when I'm with my family, would would you really want somebody to come up to you? And you know, I just started second guessing everything, and I got so nervous, I walked towards him and then just sort of turned left and carried on walking. So I I, I hear you. It's uh, the, everybody's a fan of somebody. I remember when we had our old our, our old studio, um, the Stooges got back together and rehearsed there, the surviving members. So it was Iggy and James and I can't remember who else was alive at the time. But um, And Mike Watt was playing bass. And in the room next door, um, Rick Rubin was doing pre-production with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And Rick and Anthony came to the front desk and asked if they could be introduced to Iggy Pop. Wow. <laughs> And they, and they stood, stood outside, outside the door, the door and, and we knocked on the on the studio door and I went inside the studio and I said, oh, you know, between songs, I said, hey, Iggy, um, do you want to meet Anthony Kiedis from the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Rick Rubin? Uh, they would really like to meet you. And they just basically stood outside the door waiting like a couple of kids for like five minutes. And then we opened the door and brought them in and they it was like a sort of audience with Iggy. But... I, but you sort of understand the point. I mean, those two guys are multi-millionaires, several, probably a hundred times over. Yeah. And there's a guy, Iggy, he's, he's a legend to all of us, but nowhere near as wealthy and successful. But, you know, everybody's a fan of somebody, you know. Yeah. Oh, definitely. That's, that's amazing. It, you, you would think someone like Anthony Keyes, the man who happily goes on stage wearing nothing but a sock, yeah. would be fearless of, of anything, but... I wonder, but when you see Anthony Kiedis jumping around in a pair of shorts or and or just trousers and and his shirt off and the way he performs, you know that's Iggy. You know he's channeling Iggy Pop. And ah, that's yeah, true. yeah, that's yeah. A good so point. that's a very good point. I've never seen it. Maybe I don't really read interviews with with Anthony, but I I, I imagine you know that's definitely one of his biggest heroes and one and you know that's the one of the great things about the Chili's that they're best, especially if you go back to like Mofo Party Plan and Mother's Milk. Is that sort of like punk rock aesthetic mixed in with musicianship as well? You know, they were like great funk rock players, but they also had kind of a middle finger kind of a reverence that definitely owed a lot to like bands like the Stooges. And, and, mm -hmm. and you know, so I, yeah, my gut is, is he's definitely channeling Iggy. So yeah, he was like a little kid. And then Ritz, to see Rick Rubin like that as well was really, really impressive, you know. Yeah, because I mean, he's not worked with loads of really famous people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it's, it's, it's easier to work with people you maybe admire but not a huge fans of. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Like when I when I work with Aerosmith, I, I like Aerosmith, but it wasn't like my favorite band. I can't imagine mm -hmm. working with my favorite band. That would yeah. be. I, I met Jeff Beck a few years ago, and he said Steve Lucas had produced an album for him, which didn't come out. I shouldn't be saying this on, on live, but I am. <laughs> And, and I said, well, what happened? He goes, oh, I really like Steve, but he was too much of a fan. 
So the mm -hmm. artist can feel it sometimes. Because, yeah. you know, if when you're working with somebody, whatever, when you're demoing something, do, recording something, whatever it might be, you, you, you need a bit of push and pull with the person you're working with so you, they can get something from you. If they're just literally going, oh, my God, Adam, you're amazing. Like, everything you say is amazing, Adam. I mean, you're a genius. Just want to let you know, you're amazing. Yeah. You know, if you guys had that relationship with each other, your content would be awful, wouldn't it? It'd be like yeah. Liam going, you know, Adam, you're amazing. I uh, you're amazing too no no you're amazing you know it's like <laughs> yeah or, or you'd end it's... up like producing the track like the version of the band that you wished you'd heard rather than what's right for them like yeah it would be so many things in there that just wouldn't be right yeah yeah, yeah Someone... it's uh are you a big dave grohl fan Foo fighters friend than adam because somebody's uh not commenting on that uh I, I kind of am. I mean, I've done a couple of Foo Fighters tracks on the channel before. I do like what they do very much. But it's funny, Dave Grohl's such a multi-talented git. I get the feeling that if he ever did come in here, I'd just tell him to sit behind the desk and produce me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, right, here's a computer. Tell me, what do I do? <laughs> Teach me a wise one. <laughs> so, so, um, so it's, yeah, I, I, I see you. Um, I've been watching your channel. I see that... Excuse me, I see you playing like multiple instruments. I've got the two views. I can see the view that way. And the most looking here. You have a very what is rare that? Is that insight, sound What's is that? that soundtracks? What's that? Soundtracks? What's that console there? Oh, the console yeah. is an Allen and Heath. It's an old GL3300. Ah. Okay, it's an Allen and Heath. I knew it was a British 70s slash 80s console, but I couldn't tell. Yeah, don't tend to use it much anymore because I've got these really nice preamp banks that we got from an old BBC building that got knocked down. Should we, should we show him? Yeah, yeah, what are they? What are the pieces? Yeah, so um, we've got well two over here from their symphonic orchestra hall, which it actually labels them as high gain line amps. Mm -hmm. uh, right. But they're essentially kind of very similar to Neve preamps. And then I've got another um, 18 of them down below on, on my right hand side without the EQ section. Ooh. And those things are the real deal. Yeah, we um we were really lucky when uh, the BBC on Oxford Road was being demolished. Um, after the BBC had sold it to the demolition crew, we the guy that was working on this building, um, said, "Do you want to go in and have a look?" Because we own the building now, and we went in and they left, and we basically bought off the demolition crew all these old preamps, and uh, we cleaned them up and got them working, and we've not been able to find anything like them anywhere, have we? Yeah, even the technical manuals don't seem to exist anymore. What, do they have any numbers on them or anything? They do. Um, they, the preamps are AM7 slash 13. Uh, yeah, I know them. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. AM7. Uh, actually, I used to have a pair. Um, so, um, Cowrec made those as well. Oh. And so, okay. did, so did Audix and I think Neve. So, what, what they were is they're BBC spec Yeah. So yeah, all we these got, yeah, we companies, got that bit. That was, yeah. Yeah. So, different companies would make them. No, oh. I... I, I um, yeah, those are good. I had the uh, AMS, AM6, which is the um, the compressor, which is the look-ahead compressor for broadcast. Nice. Yeah, those are, those would be really good. Yeah, so we've got, I think it's 10 of those, and the rest are the AM712s, which are like the low-gain version. But right. um, what I've thought about those is that they're, they're line amps, but if I get something like I've got an Audient preamp bank, which is very clean, Yep. I, I can then send the output from them into the lineups to get all the tonal flavor. That's so pretty amazing. All the stuff like Phantom Power is then taken care of, impedance matching is all done, and then we get the vintage flavor. Mm. No, it was like Christmas that day, wasn't it? The amount of stuff we came out with. It was ridiculous. Right. We, we what else in. did you get? Make me jealous. <laughs> oh, uh, well, actually, if you can see the wooden console on the main camera behind us. Yeah. That was from that building. Uh, this was built, this was in the studio where uh, Northwest Tonight's news used to be. And before wow. that, Red Dwarf. Yes. Oh, Red Dwarf. So yeah. this is technically, Red Dwarf was mixed on this <laughs> desk. <There you> go. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Oh, we had a field day. Yeah. And our, our, stu our studio doors are from um, BBC Radio Manchester as well. So we've got proper BBC. We've got so much BBC gear in here, it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. I've got some. I have some. I I had some Carex PQ ten sixty ones from BBC Radio Manchester. Um, unfortunately, they have gone. Um, and I used to have a. I, I used to, yeah, I had quite a few bits and pieces. So one of my friends used to work for them. Um, um, 
um, Duke Butcher, Julian Butcher, he used to work for the BBC and then they spun that whole, he did outside broadcast and they spun that whole thing off now. So mm -hmm. I don't really have any, when, when I was a kid, they used to train people up as engineers at massive amounts of staff, but mm -hmm. now, now they outsource everything, which yeah. is a real shame. Yeah, they do. Yeah. No. It's, it's a real shame. I mean, they, they were like the training ground for so many talented people, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a funny but attitude. It's probably why we do what we do because none of that, that none of that sort of classic training exists anymore. No, but then from what I gather, especially on the technical side, it was kind of like the Cambridge of of uh, audio way. You did it a certain way, or you didn't do it at all, and you got in trouble. And whereas my method was always the more, like you say, the punk rock approach of well, how many different ways can I do this on the cheap? <laughs> right. And well, then when yeah. it goes wrong, learn how to do it I right. I would say that, about, but I have friends that came through the training, and so what they would do is like Martin Colley was uh, was one of their uh, engineers, and what he would do is he'd give give the guys guys and girls coming up a four channel mixer which just had four volume controls on it mm -hmm. right. and four microphones, and say go and record a band. So right. he would really challenge people to like figure out where to place a mic when a band was playing live, and you know mm -hmm. it would do so it. It definitely they may have taught some like you know the right way of doing certain things but they also challenged you to problem solve it was a, mm -hmm. it was pretty pretty amazing um, from what I can tell and all the guys I know that went through it are all the best I've ever worked with yeah um, super super talented and and then what would happen is BBC would train them they go work a couple of years for the BBC and then ITV and Channel 4 and all those companies would you know just steal them because they they were being trained up so i don't know what the what it would be now i suppose you just go to a tech college you know and learn that way i don't really know in what what you do in britain anymore there's still um thingy in manchester isn't there sound uh, there's the school of sound recording yeah school of sound recording which is like a college you can go to that's quite well kitted out yeah, That's about the few, only place I, I, I think know. quite a lot of people in the north go to liverpool of institute performing arts paul mccartney's place and right, right. Yeah, I've met a few people from there in future works in Manchester who end yeah. up, they end up knowing how to do things really quite well. But no, I mean, the rest of it, as you say, like, you, the other thing is, though, I think it's interesting is if you want to start learning something, we were talking about this in the podcast last week, you can now, back in the day, you'd have to find a book if you didn't know or find a course. Whereas now, if you want to start recording, you can Google it and in five minutes you can start recording because you can find a YouTube video and it'll give you the basics for it. Yeah. Whereas sign up for a course and produce like a pro. Hey, <laughs> we, were, we were saying we were talking. It's because we were talking about. Um, I remember doing my first ever EP when I was fifteen with my mate's band, and the sound just sounded awful, and I didn't know why. And it's because I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I just had a copy of Cubase or something, and was just plugging everything in and trying to record it. And I went to the local guitar shop and asked them, "Well, what can I do? What am I missing?" And he just said, "Oh well, um, you need a DSer. That's that's what you need, and that'll make it sound perfect." And then for the, literally the next 10 years, I thought that was the answer. That was a magical thing that I didn't, I didn't know where to get one because I had no idea, no internet. I was looking around for a ds -er, and he was basically just screwing with me, telling me, like, just something bullshit. But there was no way to learn anything. Whereas now, you say, it's course season, go online. Like, yeah, it's, it's so crowded, though, now, isn't it? When, yeah. when I started uh, a little under five years ago, when I started, it was... Um, it, there was a lot of people doing it. Now it's just, like... Four or five years later, it's just because you, you know that everybody's got their everybody's got their videos on how to use a compressor. Everybody's got their video on how to use now multiband and then now mm -hmm. dynamic compressors. Everything's covered. I and mean, if I write in dynamic compressor or multiband compressor now, I mean five hundred videos will come up. Mm. And you know, I get people like students following me and they're like going, they're asking me how to grow their business. And sometimes I just say to them, why don't you just start a YouTube channel? I mean, the reality is, is you can, uh, most videos I see now, if I watch the first five minutes, they're an amalgamation of everybody's video. It's like everybody's, a. it's, I wish there was more people making music um, and less people talking about making <laughs> music. You know, it's, it's a difficult one. <laughs> You know, some people, I, sometimes I watch a video, I think it's really cool, but I can't find any music that that person's ever made, mm. you know, um, and that's cool. But I want to know that they have they have done something exciting with this technique that they're teaching you mm -hmm. um, rather than just professionally teaching the technique. Um, so maybe a bit like you have people like professional um, 
oh, what do you call it with their the skills in football um, like kick ups and stuff like that you have the people that can do amazing kick ups and spin and stuff but put them in a football game and they wouldn't know how to play like some of yeah. the people, freestyle yeah like freestyle footballers compared to like say an actual professional football it's completely different putting them in a match yeah like, well I think just like what we're doing here for instance I mean we've got 12 people watching I mean this is probably you know this is probably one, one of the most important things we can do because we can just have like a super honest conversation and talk about music and stuff like that yeah. one of one of one of the realities with professional YouTubing you know this be really blunt is like people can they've got the time to create a professional YouTube video which means they can watch 50 different videos, make notes, edit it super tight, put in the captions, do this, uh, and it's a business model, and that's fine. It's a professional YouTuber, um, but it doesn't really. I suppose. I suppose I find a little bit of a cynicism in that. I want. To, I want my stuff to be accessible by everybody, but I, I, I think I maybe have rather altruistic ideas because when I started, there was Graham, a recording revolution, and then there was Dave Pensado. Yeah. And Graham had like 200,000 subscribers and Pensado. I remember the number 106,000. I remember thinking, wow, how do you get 106,000 subscribers, you know? Mm -hmm. And Graham was sort of all about starting people off. He had that thing called the $300 studio. And then Dave was like super like all he would do is interview and still does like like – whoever's got the latest number one single here's you know phineas from you know did this number one hit and here's this week's number one and i just felt like well where's the bit in the middle where's the bit where you connect people that are trying to start up or struggling to understand how to make music and then with the professionals and bring them all together so that was that was why i didn't sort of call it my name i just wanted to sort of create this this thing where we could really feel like a community mm -hmm. and like help each other and i've it, but, you know, it's I'm always trying to find and the reason why I reached out to you, Adam, was trying to find other people like minded because I've I've done I've almost every channel you can think of. I've done some kind of um, collaboration with mm -hmm. and what I'm always looking for is to collaborate with people and then they stay around, you know, and like we keep doing stuff because I feel like it's I'm, I'm not doing this to make it. It's not it's not called Warren's place. You know what I mean? I'm trying yeah. to do something. Yeah, yeah much bigger i'm trying to bring people together but then i find that you know people are like you know i recently maybe six months ago really helped bring somebody to the fore with their channel and then they just sort of disappeared into doing their own thing and that's fine but i i, I don't i feel like i want us all to sort of help rather than try to like make it all about me it's all about me and i think that's the only downside with youtube um which i'm sure people can touch can understand is is that people live and die by the view number and the engagement and how many likes they got and mm -hmm. yeah. and, and a sort of endorphin rush and they spend three days making a video going we got we got ten thousand views in the first two hours you know something like that and, and i yeah. feel like that's not as important as knowing that you're talking to people and helping them um you know what i mean absolutely i, I think you could definitely testament to that i mean yes. you're saying that the five years you've been making videos weekly from when the channel had one subscriber to now it's got 20,000. Like, yeah. y you've made a lot of videos to know people. And say, and this podcast, I'm mean, saying, yeah, there's, there's 12 people watching live now. Usually between 200 and 800 people watch it during the week, not live. Um, and yeah. it's important to engage with them and, like, on a, a real level. And I completely. A My lot wife of... is calling. You have to excuse me a second. Oh. Keep, keep talking. I'll be back in a second. Sure. <laughs> Ooh. He's in oh. trouble. <laughs> well, he, did, he did say he only had 10 minutes about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> Random special guest, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I apologize Warren, for facing that way. Yeah, and sorry about the echo, but because this was unexpected, um, we're having to hear him through the speakers on the TV, uh, which I have now turned down so we can only just hear it. And uh, the sound is then being piped through OBS, so there's a slight time delay, which is someone on the mixer said it's not difficult to stop the echo. Yes, we know. But if I turn him off, we can't hear him. And if we can't hear him, we don't have a conversation. So it's... But yeah, um, someone else said in the chat, uh, rather have Warren with Echo than no Warren at all. Definitely. Yeah, and like I said, I've turned him down quite a lot so that um, we, he's just kind of a little bit echoey now. And if this happens again at some point in the future, hopefully we'll actually have some warning. Because mm -hmm. um, Warren is the guy that I was going to talk to, as I said at the start of the stream, but wasn't... Can say just in case, 
Uh, and wasn't expecting him to say yes when I was being cheeky then and say, hey, do you want to come on the podcast? <laughs> but it sounds like he's got a similar ethos to us though as well, though, in terms of that. Like, we are, like, yes, we're a YouTube channel, but we're not the YouTubers that care about that sort of stuff. It is about yeah. making the right sort of content. And yes, they, we want people to follow us on Patreon. We want to be able to turn it into a full-time thing. But the studio is still a full-time thing. We're, like, like it's, it's not a vanity project. It's... These are the skills and things we love doing. Like, yeah, it's, this isn't work. Like, especially for you, the studio, and like doing this and teaching people. Absolutely. And it's funny that when I make a video, I don't usually, unless I'm feeling a bit cheeky on a given day, I don't usually make a video just for the views. I tend to make a video with the intention of it being a good quality video that helps people. Mm -hmm. And then to me, it's like putting a message in a bottle, throw it in the ocean. And sometimes um, we don't get many views on it. Ah, he returns. Uh, sometimes, yeah. oh, you're back. I, I did hear a little bit what you're talking about. Yeah, I think it's important. You know, I was just talking to somebody about this this morning. Uh, I went to my kids' uh, Halloween thing. Here in America, they do, like, Halloween's a big deal. Yeah. And the school, like, all the parade and stuff. And the music teacher for my, for my uh, children's school is absolutely amazing. Oh. Um, she, and she's also, like, super smart, like, uh, speaks at events and, 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 and is really highly educated. And we were talking about this this morning um, about, you know, doing, you know, do you do things that you know will be successful or do you do things that are going to help people? And sometimes, occasionally, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the time, most of the time when it comes to actual proper music education, whether it be teaching instruments how to play them or whatever, most of the time doing the right thing is not the most successful thing. And mm -hmm. that's just kind of the way it is. And I, but I do think that the integrity and the credibility of what you do is, is most important. And you may not get like, you know, you can get like a million views by go, doing videos going, John Bonham was the world's greatest drummer and everybody else sucks or 20 greatest this or like all mm -hmm. these big kind of like clickbaity titles mm -hmm. and videos and reinforce, you know, things why computers suck. They don't suck. We, we know they don't suck. <laughs> but, you know, you, uh, you know, Apple sucks. If you do like a video saying Apple sucks, mm -hmm. you know, because they're a minority in the real world of music making, all the PC guys love to hate on Apple. Mm -hmm. But that's just not true. We, you don't have, I'm not saying you have to use an Apple computer. Please use a PC. But mm -hmm. my point is they don't suck. But it's a great way to get a million views on a video. And I think the challenge for us always is, is just, to, just to give really good, positive information that's going to help people get tru truly, genuinely better. And I do believe that you know whether you have 28,000 or 280,000 uh, um, subscribers doesn't really matter because – the people that are attracted to you and come and like you and follow you and comment on your videos are going to be people that you want to talk to. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't, I see those big videos of Apple sucks or something like that. And then I scroll through and it's just like, wow, it's like troll city. It's mm -hmm. just like, yeah, yeah effing this and effing mm -hmm. that. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, okay, if, if, if to get a million subscribers and make $20,000 a month in YouTube advertising, if that's what I have to be, I don't want to be that person. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, I had a bit of an existential crisis over it about a year ago because I was just like, I do well, but do I need to do these kinds of videos? Do I need to, uh, you know? And then I realized I like our audience. I like the kind of people that come to guys like you and I and come and see what we do. And I like that. And I want those kind of people. They're really great people, you know. Um, but anyway, the reason why I wanted to contact you is because, A, I really like the, 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 uh, the quality and, and, and the quantity of videos you do. Uh, but it was also triggered by the fact that I did that video with uh, Glenn on Reaper. Oh, yes. And all the Reaper people that work for Reaper reached out to me. Or, um, <laughs> that, you know, let's do some videos together. And I was like... I was like, yeah, I'd like to do videos on Reaper, but I want to do videos on Reaper not by people paid by Reaper. You know what I mean? Right, I'm assuming okay. you're not paid by Reaper, are you? Absolutely not. Okay, uh, good. If, Let's do some if videos. anything, we've paid them far more than they paid us. <laughs> Those are the but, people I want to talk to. I, I started using Reaper over a decade ago. I've, I've paid for their license a couple of times now because I've actually been using it that long. Here's a weird thing about Reaper. When you yeah. buy a license for Reaper, they give you two full versions with that license. Amazing. And I've still had to buy more than one license. <laughs> That's how long I've been doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's it's funny that way back when I was learning, I used Sonar, which was okay. It was cool. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, then I went to college, university, uh, did a little bit of tape splicing. We did a lot of work on Cubase, which I got to grips with. It was it was it was useful. It was good. Uh, but at the time, there were some real limitations in Cubase. Like you couldn't reorder plugins. Uh, you had to do your routing in a certain way that wasn't an analog way at the time. Right. Like you couldn't go through group buses very easily and that kind of thing. It was all very difficult and complicated. Uh, and then we went to Pro Tools and Pro Tools seemed arcane in comparison. And but it definitely Pro Tools when it comes to, um, at least like 10 or 15 years ago, when it came to like MIDI and stuff like that, just seemed like it was the dark ages. Because yeah. I was the same way. I, I In the 90s, late 80s, early 90s, when I first started making any kind of music, you know, Cubase, you went, uh, you know, uh, Notatus, all the Steinberg stuff yeah. was decades ahead of Pro Tools with, with MIDI. And uh, and Pro Tools was never, it's, it's, it's definitely more than adequate now in MIDI, but at the time it was dreadful. But it was the first professional, really good audio editing software. And I think that's where it got the foothold because there was that transitional period between tape and milling, m moving fully digital where tape people could sort of understand Pro Tools. It sort of made sense to you because it was like, you know, it just had that sort of linear capability. But, um, yeah, it's it's got a foothold, um, but it seems that every day, you know, uh, new things are coming out. And then, of course, FL Studio is the number one DAW on on your phone yeah they, they outsell everybody so so what they've figured out which is smart is you know they they come up with an, an app version which is what ten dollars or whatever it is fifteen dollars for your phone mm. and they hook they hook people in on that and then they get them into the daw and they're able to upsell them into a daw which is very smart mm -hmm. um and but it seems that fl studio is like there's there's literally like 50 fl studio channels that have like a million subscribers it's like it is so huge on youtube yeah. um, um but reaper seems to have a very uh very vocal fan base yeah but not very many of them seem to be doing too much with it i guess i mean there's kenny joyer he does loads of stuff but and there's the Reaper blog, uh, John from the Reaper blog. But as far as I know, that's that's kind of it. Right, but those guys, those guys work for Reaper. Ah, now that I wasn't aware of. I got the feeling, because especially with but Kenny's Kenny videos. He works for Reaper, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, so yeah. that's what I mean. I want to sort of get hold of people that don't aren't, aren't on the payroll. Right. Because I need, because it's, it's more about, like, how do we... You know, I, I need that sort of credibility, that 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 sort of like realness of like this is what we do. You know, absolutely. Um, I, mean, um, I just interviewed. This is interesting, you know, because I just interviewed. Um, it's not a very big video because nobody knows who he is, but they should do. A guy called uh, Wilbert Roger, and he's probably one of the biggest game composers in the world. Okay, okay. Um, he does everything on Reaper. Mm. Yeah. He did uh, Star Wars, he did Call of Duty, World War II, Mortal Kombat 11, uh, Guild Wars, Path of Fire, Lara Croft, and the uh, Temple of... Uh, anyway, Desert Island 2, and you is the new one he's doing. I mean, he's huge. And everything he does is on Reaper. It makes a lot of sense to me. Um, it, it, I mean, it's funny that, like I said, Pro Tools is quite arcane, what, and, but the reason that I went to Reaper is it could do all the things that all the other DAWs could do. So there was a thing I liked in Cubase. It did it. There was a thing I liked in Logic. It did it. Right. It's it's one of those programs where it had about 10 ways to do anything, which to a complete newbie can be a little terrifying because it's like, where's the shortcut for this? You could use this or this or this or this. Mm -hmm. But if you find a way of working that works for you, it's in there already. Mm hmm and right. so if you've got a certain mindset, like I've seen guys who do game design, they use it. I've seen guys that work more like a traditional analog tape machine kind of guy. It works for them. You know, it's bizarre. Right. There's, there's a downloadable zip file you can get that turns Reaper basically into the creator for Rock Band. Right. There's so much you can do. It literally turns it into... If you put in the stems for like drums, guitar, bass... For, for rock band, you can then put all the lyrics and all the notes and everything straight in there and it's all laid out for you. <laughs> you press a button at the end, it makes you a rock band file. <laughs> wow. There's, there's so much that because it's all, 
it's not open source. I, I was think. about to say that it's almost the open source version, but it's not. Yeah. But it's so close that the the, the guys. Is it? I thought it was. I don't know necessarily. I thought it was sort of open source that everybody's yeah. is cu heavily customizable. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. A lot. Sorry. It's it's so close to open source, and I think a lot of it is public knowledge, and they don't mind you making things for it. <laughs> it's like yeah, there's like because it's six different open source licenses. The Creative Commons. It's like the one. It's three is like fully open source. I think yeah. it's like Creative Commons one or something. Right. Yeah. It's like a version of it. I've never quite looked into that, but yeah, I, I know that you you can you can make script in python which is a program like programming language that but like gary's mod or fallout like you can mod it to hell as much as you want but they still kind of own the code yeah it's yeah. that kind of thing where at the end of the day it's still reaper it's still theirs but if you want to change stuff you just do mm -hmm. bananas that's right yeah but i mean it's the yeah. same like reaper's been the sort of the bedrock for our studio like with without it the app the outlay that we were able to spend on like preamps and other things rather than the, the DAW and the software like mm. and Adam's knowledge of it he was I think that was one of the big things of what you could get out of it for the value allowed us as essentially a couple of 20 year olds out of university wanting to start their own studio it allowed us to do that I mean our first studio was just a room with a window and then the live room was just uh, a carpeted room with duvets from Asda glued onto the walls um, and we that's how we started up the studio and started getting bookings through Groupon. True. Um, and that's how we started it. And we used Reaper and an old Behringer desk we bought on eBay. Yeah. Um, and we built it up from there. It's a little different now, but that's how we started. Yeah. yeah. It was real, like, early Steve Albini type stuff. Mm -hmm. It was just like, get in there, get some egg crates, not egg crates, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> equivalent, and just go. And yeah. we did. And yeah, because I didn't have to... Yeah. Out didn't because didn't have to That's... outlay six hundred dollars a time for the next version of Pro Tools or whatever. Yeah. It didn't bankrupt us no. because our main yeah. business that paid the bills at the time was the video production. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, as much as I've always been nuts about audio production, I've always loved it, and the scene in Manchester at the time was essentially dead. There was nothing going on, and un unless you could suddenly find half a million and make a studio that, yeah. You know, the, that kind of studio no one would turn up to anywhere for any amount of money it was mm. it was weird mm. it seems to have had a big resurgence recently which is fine by us absolutely mm. great but at the time we just had to make do mm. whoa 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 my computer yeah whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what, what's going on there i don't even have the sound turned up on that thing it's like you know when they start playing ads in the background it's like yeah. whoa excuse me <laughs> <laughs> sir <laughs> sir <laughs> um no i mean i look i i i never went to college i you know not, not i didn't go to college for music mm. i never worked in any recording studios i mean everything i own in the studio i bought from making music and recording music so my first studios were you know well you know my first recordings were two cassette players mm -hmm. uh, uh my dad's philip Philips cassette player and 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 his Sony stereo. Yeah, and that's how I, I, I was using an eight track recorder in two thousand. So <laughs> that was that's, my first recording. Sounds like pretty luxury to me, lad. <laughs> oh. No, my dad's old eight track and uh, an eight track mic. Yeah, it was terrible. Yeah, we're not talking like eight track Ampex, a literal eight. -track no, like, and literally eight old school sixties eight tracks with the yeah, cassettes. No, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah and, you know, and I had a then I had a Porter One, <laughs> yeah, a Porter One which which was the most basic four track ever. <laughs> I think, I think I, it just had one input or two inputs, but you just carried on overdubbing and then. I had the yeah, fast text and, equivalent, yeah. Yeah, it was uh, high tech stuff, and yeah. then uh, I think <laughs> ADATS was the first thing I got that was sort of sounded any good, and I got an ADAT. I had mm. an ADAT and a Soundtrax Topaz was the first real equipment I had. Wow. Uh, both of which at that point were quite old. but Yeah, I've got a, a, an Alesis ADAP machine in my rack here. There you go. Yeah. Was it a black one or a, or a silver one? It's a gold one. Ah, oh, see, that's one of the newer ones. Mine's <laughs> black. I had a black one. Cost, cost me all of £30. <laughs> there you go. Funnily enough, I'm actually using it at the moment to drive headphone amps. I'm not even using the, the tape deck. <laughs> ah. Well, it's interesting that... that you know that that technology and that idea was quite smart. Um, the first person I ever I, that I I don't know if it's ne he's necessarily the one, but it was uh, 
It was uh, Frank Zappa in the 70s figured out, late 70s, that you could mix down to, um, to video tape oh. um, because it was a, the first digital audio, freely available digital audio um, available, and he swore blind that it was, you know, sounded better. <laughs> I mean, the thing about tape is, is like we all have love tape. I mean, I've got an A80 there, a 24-track <laughs> uh, oh. Studer. It doesn't get fired up very often anymore. Um, but the reality is just like anybody who actually really used tape for long periods of time wasn't the hugest fan. I mean, you know, we it sort of got this nostalgic thing, which I think is more to do with performances, more to do with the fact that bands, when restricted to 16 or 24 tracks, were forced to sort of rehearse harder, do more takes, punch in and fix, and do a little less kind of like, oh, just edit it tight. So I think there's a sort of a nostalgia with that. Um, plus, I remember when I was tracking, you used to come in and you'd listen back to the tape and you couldn't see anything. And you go, oh, it feels like I'm a little on top there. It feels like I'm like a little behind. And then you go back in and play again with the band. And so it, yeah. it definitely, the idea of tape forced you to use your ears more and use your eyes less. But anybody I know that really used tape and transitioned into digital like I did prefers digital because it's just so much more flexible and and there's there's nothing more annoying like everybody goes i like the sound of tape yeah i do like the sound of tape but i used to hate spending an hour getting an amazing guitar sound only to have it come back sounding like this because all the top end had been worked off of the tape yeah. you know and <laughs> yeah so you know it's there's a love hate with it um you know, I think there's a lot of glorification. I think more of it's to do with the performances, the songwriting, the methodology behind tape, the way we used to work around it, that we miss probably more than the sound of tape and the inflexibility of tape. I don't think we miss that. Yeah, it, it makes sense. I think I, I saw it behind the scenes of uh, Slashes, not his, maybe not his last album, the one before, and that was all recorded on tape and he was making a point of it. But it really seemed like he was making a point of the entire band would just track live. Mm. Which, yeah, I mean, exactly. Hell, it's Slash. His band is good. He can do that. And that made perfect sense to me. But if they'd done it with Pro Tools and told him it was tape, I don't think it would have been any different. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And I think, again, it's just a mentality. They could have done it. They could have done it in a digital medium and then edited it afterwards. You know, if there was something, a mistake, or they could have punched in and fixed. You can still think digitally. You can still think, sorry, you know, properly. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's to think that tape is responsible, you know. But let's look, I... I'll do a video and I will, what's interesting, I'll do a video and I'll record a whole band live. Like I've done it multiple times. I've got multiple videos where I recorded the band live straight in and I mix it with no drum samples or nothing. And it just goes out. And then I'll do a video where we'll take drums like with only four mics and we'll put a kick and snare sample against it. And then it's just like, I can't believe you're using samples. I'm like, well, where were you? complimenting the one that's live it's like there's just people triggered waiting to yeah. complain you know waiting yeah. to to no be superior <laughs> but it's like and then they'll say they'll say things like you know uh, that you know all of these musicians and then this whole channel's reinforcing this bs idea that every musician before like 1980 was a genius and everybody since 1980 isn't i mean that's yeah. literally there's whole channels and we know the channels i'm talking about that are very successful like selling this myth that um, kids no longer can play. I, I think there's more better musicians than ever. There's more access to the ability to be able to play. And this idea that everybody used to be a genius and now everybody's an idiot is just total crap. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a nice, it's a nice thing to purvey. And then I'm friend, I'm, I'm like watching these guys talk about the recording of music as though you know famous drummer x y and z were the only geniuses ever and the and that the engineers making those records were all geniuses and i'm thinking i'm friends with these engineers that they're quoting that they're believing and then i'll say to shelly yakas or uh, or uh, um, jack douglas guys that made you know damn the torpedoes tom petty or uh, rocks by aerosmith and and i'll say how did you do that and jack will be like oh yeah well we took the kick and the snare 
and we separated it by gating it, put it through a PA in a separate room to record it, to bring the sounds back in. And then I would run a speaker underneath the snare to trigger the snare. And then what I would do is I had this early digital delay and we'd sample in the snare sound and then trigger it onto a tape machine and then delay it and then push it back in. And then the drums had to be edited by tape by hand. And yeah. yet, see this guy's like, yeah, you see, back in 75, you know, this guy just played it in one take. And Jack's like, no, it took us like a week to get that right. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> but you, you, that's, you, you can't debate these people. They're all like, you, they never did this. And they're like, yeah, they did. Here's the guy <laughs> oh, that yeah. recorded it. You know? I mean, I, just, I, I'm a slightly younger that I wasn't there with a lot of this stuff. I'm 33, but I read religiously. And there was... Like one article that really stood out to me was um, the engineer recorded Whitney Houston's uh, "And I Will Always Love You" for the Bodyguard. Yeah, and everyone, everyone's like, "Oh yeah, she did it in one take." Not a chance. Apparently, yeah. she she did a couple of takes as like a, a demo, but then had a hissy fit and wouldn't go back in the studio. Apparently, uh, but yeah. it was all recorded on one of those Sony Dash digital tape machines. Yeah. And what you could do that not many engineers knew is you could actually take a sample of like a few seconds in the machine and then yeah. pitch correct it and run it back so yeah. the engineer went back and almost literally auto-tuned half that recording with the tape machine <laughs> yeah. yeah so anyone oh, who yeah. says oh yeah one tape tape yeah mm, sure i mean technically yeah. well i mean she, she was obviously an amazing singer right? and i know yeah. i know not being negative um uh, but, but i'm just going to say this but yeah her very, the one the super bowl thing where she sings and everybody says it's the greatest performance ever was yeah. pre-recorded She's miming. And it's like everybody knows that, but it's still considered like everybody goes, it's the greatest Super Bowl performance ever. What do you mean it's the greatest mime ever? What do you, what's your point? She went yeah. into a studio, sung like 50 takes, they comped it together, it's amazing, and then she mimed it. But then every time somebody comes and sings live in the Super Bowl, they're all like, not as good as Whitney Houston. Like, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's this, I think, you, you know, the uh, George Martin, you know, um, was, was an incredible producer. He played, um, you know, harpsichord um, on a song. Um, was it, is it In My Life? In My Life. Yeah, In My Life. Yeah. Uh, and they slowed the tape down to half, half the speed. He played it an octave lower so he could play it in time. And then they sped it back up. <laughs> if, if John couldn't hit a high note, they'd slow the note, slow the tape down so he could hit the high note. And you sing it, and then they'd speed it back up again. <laughs> That's what people did. It's what you do. You, Absolutely. It's, all that matters is the results. I mean, Mike Oldfield, when he did Tubular Bells, it, it, there's a documentary on it that mm -hmm. was filmed close to the time. And he talked about the fact that a lot of the string instruments he couldn't play very well. So all he would do is just slow it down to half speed and play it so he didn't make a mistake and then speed it up. I mean, it's just what you do. I mean... I think what it, you said... It, it, it's... I was going to say, what you said earlier, I think, is a really good point because I'm of a similar, my background, video production, film directing, uh, and I learned right at the beginning of digital video. So I actually learned a lot on analog as well. And I think exactly the same thing applies to video as it does to audio. And so what you're saying is it's about the methodology and the sort of no. the graft that you get from working with analog that teaches you the ways to do things. Like with video, you can you sh shutter speed your ISO, your film speed, all of that now is just considered how to make a camera brighter. They all have a function which kids don't learn if they just pick up a DSLR or their iPhone camera. It's a similar thing with, with audio. All these different things that you can affect, you can just do them on the fly now dead easy. You're not quite yeah. learning why they're there or how you should do them. So I think, yeah, the, the craft of it with the analog as opposed to the actual process of so the the final output, I'm completely with you on that. So I, I think yeah, you know, just just I did a talk. I, I agree. I did a talk with uh, Shelly Yakis at AES last weekend, and uh, you know he was talking a lot about this kind of stuff that we're talking about. We all were, and it's just like how can we, how can we bring back, because uh, it's the results now um, are easier to get. Um, but how can we encourage the sort of exploration? How can we encourage the creativity? Because, you know, it's easy. Like I said, we can, we should all like have these videos where we're like, you know, John Bonham is amazing. Everybody else sucks. Those kind of videos or, you know, all the stuff that people do to get the big, big followers, um, the big views. But the problem is, is it's not helping anybody. It's just reinforcing stereotypes. It's, it's reinforcing elitism and, and superiority, which, quite frankly, is probably why half our world is in such a mess, isn't it? Because everybody's like, 
I know best. You know, everybody's yeah. wagging their fingers at each other from their political vantage point, telling mm-hmm. each other off. Yeah. And and but really, you know, we should be like looking at it and going like I, one of my things that I really strongly believe in as a guy who owns, you know, a million dollars worth of vintage equipment and stuff. One of the things that I am I'm really believe, believe strongly is like if I'm 13 now and I'm making music for the f- first time, do I really have to know what an 1176 is? Mm-hmm. Really? Why? Do I have to? I, and frankly, do I even have to know what a 1073 is? Do I? It's like that. It, it, it's almost like we there's there's a certain amount of code that's great to know, but ultimately, I saw. I think I almost want plug-in manufacturers to just basically have like a preset of like here's 47 different vintage pieces of equipment if you want a vintage sound the idea of like you know launching another 1176 clone or another 1073 clone or another this start is starting to feel a little exhausting to me because i'm just like does a kid really need to know that there are things they need to know it's almost like we bog down and we reinforce stereotypes but what mm-hmm. we should be doing is smashing through doors and like opening up the creativity so i understand your point about the functionality mm-hmm. of, of like cameras and filmmaking and mm-hmm. editing and music but how can we how can we encourage them to be creative um hmm. how can we encourage them to be creative so there's a, a foot in the past enough but it doesn't i don't know it doesn't hold them back because yeah. mm-hmm. Hate the debate online of this sort mm-hmm. of like you know like we're talking about this sort of elitist superior I know best sort of mm-hmm. expert thing drives me nuts. I, I, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I completely I completely get you with that. I think it's, it's kind of on the same point of what I've always said. The way that I look to try and approach the studio with them, obviously building it together, is when we were looking at building gear because um, you were similar. Oh, I need this mic. I, I need one of those mics to get that sound. And we sort of said, okay, well. It's the craft, it's the skill of how you work with the sound that's the most important. And how can we get to, our first thing was, how can we get to sound that's passable? And then from there, how can we get to good sound? And eventually we got to the point where it's, okay, how can we get like 90% of the way there to a million dollar studio with only spending a few grand essentially? And eventually we think we, we, I, we felt we got to like 95%, the last 5% would have cost us another million dollars um, in equipment. But, right. but you can get to that top 95 without it. And I think in terms of teaching kids today, you can show them how to get to that 95% through methodology, approach, um, and being able to do it. I mean, you have you do videos on how to mix on your iPad. You've got yeah. um, your other laptop that's like a, a cheap laptop that's from a few years old that was yeah. on discount. is showing people how you can mix on a cheap old laptop. You can pick them up on eBay. Yeah. Those ways of showing the accessibility to kids, but also on a view of, okay, here's the accessibility. But and then these are the stages and what it takes to get to that sort of classic sound that you're looking for. And yeah. I think I think for me that was the thing that motivated yep. me that we can get as close as possible to that million dollar sound without spending that money. But that last bit, I do think there's there's an elusiveness yeah. that without 1176 and those things, yeah, can you recreate that? Can people tell? But then that's where it gets. My philosophy for a long time has always been not just what do we need. Uh, but why? Yes, why? Yes, why? Yes, yes, yes. Why do I need that piece of gear? Like I, I lusted after eleven seventy sixes for years as a great example, and I tell you what, I don't have a single one in this studio. You know right. why? Because I know why I wanted one now. I know what they do, and I know yeah. that I can get exactly that thing that I wanted out of it without having to spend the money and the actual hardware setup on that because Mm -hmm. my deal was always why why -hmm. does this microphone sound like this why does that compressor do that why Mm -hmm. why 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 Mm -hmm. and i could i can now talk for hours about the why and i can tell you why i mean it sounds clickbaity but why you don't need an 1176 i mean i i love the sound of them i do i really do Mm -hmm. but i mean it's a whole kind of thing of in software I could do that, but then why would I use one on this instrument but not this instrument? Why? Mm-hmm. And then why would I use it in this circumstance but not that circumstance? What is it doing that makes me want to use it there and not want to use it there? Because then my understanding of the craft is better. Mm-hmm. I think far too many videos, it's a very good point, say oh, you should get one of these and you press this button and you turn it up and you go, yeah, great, okay. Why? Mm-hmm. Why? 
What does it do? I mean, yes, it sounds like that, but what if I tried it on something else? And I don't mean the cliched, there are no rules thing. I hate that. I mean, of course and there are no rules. That's that's by the by. But why? <laughs> why yeah. does this work? Why does that not work? How do I get to that sound without spending all the money I don't have? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. It's it, it's interesting. I just, I just did a video. Um, I think last Friday's video I talked about... Um, I brought this up many, many times, but I talked about Jeff Emmerich being, I think he was 19 turning 20 during uh, um, Revolver. And he became the engineer because uh, Norman Smith, there was some kind of union strike or something with EMI Studios. So Norman Smith, who was their engineer up until that album had done Help and Hard Day's Night and all the rest, all the other great records, wasn't able, and Rubber Soul, wasn't able to do Revolver. So they hired the guy who had been assisting um you know, on the al- album or two before and said, oh, you know, Jeff, you're now our engineer. And he's 19, 20 years old. <laughs> and, and so I was just sort of making that point and I've made it many times. So, um, forgive anybody that watches us in the future and goes, oh, Warren's saying the same thing. But the reason why I bring it up is like, no matter, he may have been at Abbey road for a couple of years at that point after leaving high school, maybe, you know, a secondary school that may be 16, 17 years old. <laughs> However, he's not, 50 years old and he hadn't been doing it for 30 plus years um so he was and really you know the 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 information that was available in those times it was a four track machine there was a handful of microphones that they used and a way of doing things so everything else he had to sort of make up as he went he was just like inventing ideas he very famously had to ask permission to be able to put a, a mic inside of the kick drum because of the sound pressure levels, all these sort of famous stories of things that they had to do, which seemed quite commonplace now. And I, I said all this and then somebody said, oh, yeah, I agree with you, Warren, but, you know, you really need to learn everything and know all the rules before you can break them. And I'm just like, did you listen to anything I just said? You know what I mean? It's just like this guy couldn't have known the rules and yet. If you ask, you know, you know, musicologists, not, you know, what is the greatest albums of all time? They'll always go either one or number two, Revolver or Pet Sounds. It's just in everybody's number one or two greatest albums ever made is Revolver and Pet Sounds. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, so what is your point, Mr. Person saying that? It's like, it's, it's, it's the intent and the passion and the, and the creativity that makes great music, mm-hmm. um, not the gear, not anything. Now, don't get me wrong. Obviously, if the gear is so bad that you can't capture something well, then that's that is going to be a problem. Um, mm. They did have nice a nice tape machine and a nice console and a nice environment with nice microphones. Um, but you don't necessarily have to have a U forty seven to be able to record a Beatles album. But you do have, definitely have to have songs like the Beatles and a creativity like the Beatles mm-hmm. if you want to. So it's we we definitely misplace our information but i think that the one of the problems is is that the people that are educating you know we have to take responsibility because the educators um it, you know whatever their agenda is to to be more famous to get more views to make more income from a youtube or whatever it might be whatever that agenda is you know it's difficult you you've got if you're going to be honest and tell the truth it's not going to be as successful as as once again, you know, going back to what we first talked about, reinforcing some old stereotype that everybody before 1980 was a genius and everybody else since isn't, you know, mm, that yeah. kind of thinking. Um, and I don't like it because I meet kids now that are far more talented than my, me and my friends were when we were 16. They're far more into it. They put more hours in. They're more passionate about it. Um, and they have better access to information than I ever did, you know? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Right. I think that's a very good place to uh, put a full stop on this segment. Uh, yeah, especially because gonna... I can just talk for hours. Yeah, well, <laughs> especially because you said you only had 10 minutes. Uh, so I'll tell you what, Warren, um, I'll call I you know. back when we finish the podcast, which won't be very far off, because we are already an what? hour and 20 over time. <laughs> <laughs> we were already running late when you called in, so that's what that's yeah, what we it's, do. It, it's 12, is it 11.30? Uh, it's 10 30 the clocks went back so we're doing okay well yeah you're, you, we, well, it's done go back for another week yeah or go back this sunday i think yeah right yeah so we're in that little overlap yeah so we're uh yeah we're not doing too bad Marvelous. yes well thank great you very much to you for tuning in, yeah, great, great speaking ladies to you ladies and gentlemen warren hewitt so yeah i'll, I'll call you back very shortly <laughs> thanks adam thanks for cheers. cheers cheers bye, bye. thanks bye-bye. 
well, oh, that happened. <laughs> yeah. So, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Um, we Jeez. weren't ignoring the questions. I was checking them, and it seemed like most of the stuff you were asking, oh, Marty, you asked the same question twice. Uh, I felt like he'd kind of picked up on that, talking about the equipment that he'd had to begin with. So, um, but if not, I feel that maybe some more collaborations in the future. So, yeah. uh, any other questions? We'll make sure that they're, they're picked up. Yeah, um, but, um, that was, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyone who's listened to this entire podcast on iTunes or Spotify, I'll be very impressed indeed because, wow, we've gone over Comment time. below if you got through the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, let me just have a look at this script to see. I, th- I think, yeah, um, I'm quickly going to play you a, a track that we recorded today because... Talking- Should we leave that to next week? It, it is half ten. And you just say you're going to call me back. Yes. Um, well, it's. I'll play. It's three minutes long, and then that'll be the end of the the, okay. the podcast. So this uh, talking about gear and not being necessarily important. This uh, is a songer who was uh, a songer. You can tell my brain's going. This mm-hmm. is a singer called Ella who was in the studio earlier today. She was. She was. And uh, I'm going to make it very quiet in here so we don't get that uh, horrible echoey thing. I'm also going to turn off the picture of Warren that's now frozen because he's logged off and people actually saying play it in the chat and (laughs) this was she had a great voice this was using the slate virtual microphone system Uh, so we ended up going with the sony c800 g mic and it's got uh, a distressor and the 401 compressor on it no eq Mm -hmm. at all and a bit of a plate reverb have a listen to this this is this is a cover um, so we're probably going to get flagged for this, but uh, never mind. I don't particularly care on this one. Have a listen to this. Mild compression, no EQ. This is what the Slate vo- Virtual Microphone System can do. Oh, 
ones now. But how about that? That is a hell of a sound. And there's no auto-tune, no Melodyne, uh, no volume automation either. Um, I've got just the right amount of compression on that uh, distressor that's only catching peaks it's acting, like in 1176, like we were talking about before. Then the 401 compressor is doing that opto thing. Uh, so, um, oh, question, was it tracked with all of the processing or adding plugins during the mix? It was tracked with the processing on uh, because I have a very low latency system here, but using the virtual microphone system, um, I live monitor through the system because it's about two milliseconds of latency. And it makes singers much more comfortable if they feel good with a little bit of saturation, compression, bit of plate reverb, that kind of thing. Uh, the piano backing track isn't one that I uh, produced. The backing track was something that the singer brought in, but the vocal itself is what I wanted to play to you today. And that is the power of a great singer, like we were saying before. Um, I found the right virtual mic to fit her voice. And with absolutely minimal processing there's a deesser as well to stop it being too toppy and yeah uh, that's it so yeah that was why i wanted to play that to you today because um the virtual microphone system is something that i got onto as soon as i could and it's kind of my pride and joy vocal mic right now uh now <coughs> backing track could be lower yeah well yeah, we'll we'll see. Uh, that's the kind of thing that I'll probably listen to it separately in the car or whatever and then realise that maybe I could. But that's the kind of thing where I could go through with a fine-tooth comb and uh, automate volume levels. And if that was ever to be released uh, as a big production, I definitely would do that. But believe it or not, that was actually just... We only did three takes. We did that uh, for her personal benefit. Uh, I actually did that as a free of charge thing because we're working on a, a song that she was involved with for a charity, which I'll talk about another time. Uh, but literally just had some spare time at the end and went, hey, we've got this vocal set up. There you go. So um, that brings us to the end of this week's Hot Pole Position podcast. Once again, thanks to everyone who's tuned in live at 8 p.m. UK time. And thanks to everyone listening on Catch Up on YouTube and on iTunes on, and Spotify. Thanks as always to our supporters on Patreon. You help us to keep doing what we're doing. More videos are always coming out on the YouTube channel. Keep an eye out as at least one video a week is released. And we'll see you all back here next week. Enjoy your week and we'll see you here 8pm next Thursday. Thursday, Thursday, Thursday. Thursday.